beautiful music that we have to start the program. We can start the program. Hello. Hello. Well, beautiful music, but we have to start the program. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, your honors. Good morning, attendees. Welcome to 11th program of annual seminar on cultural competency. I have to turn off my uh, telephones and put this thing in this uh, scenario so I can, okay. I apologize for interruption. Uh, today is, Definitely, for me, it's the most important day of the year. This is where we, when we started 11 years ago, the program that today you recognize that cultural competency in family law practice. Thank you for judicial officers where they participated. Thank you to our speakers of today, which you all know and will know at the end of this program. Uh, I have to thank uh, Los Angeles County Bar Association, Christian Adrian, President, and Park, past president, uh, uh, Stan Bissey, uh, uh, CEO of LACWA. They did a great job of supporting the program this year. They agreed, and especially our, my friend, uh, Stephen Kowalty and team of uh, Family Law Executive Committee with they accepted the program as part of the LACWAS and family law uh, the sections, official training from this year on. Thanks for to Iranian American Lawyers Association with in joint managing of the program. You will hear from president. Thank you to Los Angeles Daily Journal, they really did a great job this year uh, introducing the program. Uh, David Houston, the chief editor, and Diana Bossetti, the legal editor, which they uh, allocated one full page of Daily Journal on 26 to this program. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, our, all our sponsors of the event, including uh, Association of Certified Family Law Specialists, AAML, IAFL, uh, all of the um, family law practitioners, FMBK, and other friends and uh, professional entities which they program to help the program. We're going to start. If, if if Bill is here, I don't I see his name, but I don't see his face. Good morning, Bill. Bill Spiller, he doesn't need really no introduction. He is in, in the space all the, all, uh, already. Uh, Bill and me, uh, he is on vacation somewhere in the, around the world on the universe. 
and going to join me in the program. Bill, you want to say good good morning to everyone so we can start the program. Absolutely, and good morning. Thank all of you for participating in the 11th Annual Cultural Competency Seminar this year. Uh, as usual, my, my leading comment will be uh, that it is wonderful for us to get back together, but what this competency seminar is actually missing more than anything is the lunch spread that used to be put on by the IA, uh, by, uh, BA, and uh, all of the wonderful food that we used to have when this was an in-person uh, seminar. So I'm going to stay on uh, a boss to make sure that we can come back together and enjoy the spread that uh, we used to enjoy uh, when this was an in-person seminar. But today we are going to talk about the concept of convivencia, which is a Spanish word that encompasses the Moorish period in history when Muslims, Christians, Christians, and Jews lived in relative peace. The word also refers to the interplay of cultural ideas between the three religious groups and ideas of religious tolerance. Now, obviously, the seminar is not about the religion. However, the concept of getting along and being culturally aware in the courtroom with who you're dealing with uh, and the, the ideas that you're dealing with and what all of the different people that come before the court bring to the court it is important to understand the convivencia concept. Uh, this describes one of the rare periods in history where the three religions were not in conflict and did not keep their distance from each other. Although this period ended essentially with the onset of the Spanish Inquisition, a uh, little bit of history there, the concept remains alive in our modern systems, in theory, if not in fact. So the presenters today are going to talk about the concept and how that interplays with the court system and what we do uh, as lawyers, judges, and contributors to the mental health of those that come before the court. And again, I want to thank everyone and our sponsors and Abbas. Uh, and at this point, I'll turn it back over to Abbas so we can continue to go. Yes, and we have as our part of welcoming committee the honor of welcoming uh, Judge Kaufman, uh, supervising Judge uh, Los Angeles County Bar. Judge Kaufman, will you please honor us? Yes, thank you, Abbas. Um, I'm honored to be here. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first started uh, 10 years ago, you invited me to this, I think it was the second annual, an amazing conference. Uh, I ditto uh, Bill Spiller. I'm ready to be back in person. But nonetheless, we're here uh, in our homes or offices. So what I, my two cents, I guess I wanna put in here and why I think this is such an important conference is that I, I had a visiting friend from the Midwest just this week who said to me, what's so amazing about Los Angeles is all the cultures. And sometimes we take it for granted, but when you go to the grocery store or wherever you go on a regular basis, you don't see the same type of people. We see everyone from all sorts of walks of life, cultures, sizes, shapes, everything, much more than many other cities. And what does that do for us and our practice? It means we need to know more. We need to listen and learn. It's probably impossible unless you're one of those very special people that can learn everything all the time and have a photographic memory to know about every culture. It's okay if you don't. What we need to know is to be how to learn and to listen. So for lawyers, I ask you that when you have clients that maybe you think the bench officer might not be familiar with that particular culture or background, just impart the knowledge. For bench officers, we need to listen and be attuned to different cultures and needs of litigants from all over the world and varying backgrounds. And for me, that's the critical part about this conference is learning to learn and to listen. So have a great day because you have great speakers to listen to and to learn from. Thank you very much for asking me to uh, join you this morning. And thank you. Thank you very much, Your Honor. We are very pleased that you have time to join us. And probably Stephen Kowalki is going to tell us that maybe from next year, we're going to be have live and have lunch. Uh, Steve, will you go forward, please? 
Thanks, Abbas, and uh, thank you all for attending. And thanks to all of the professionals and judicial officers who are working so hard to put it on. Um, and special thanks to Carmen Richardson and her staff for actually making it possible. Um, very happy to have the cultural competency training be now a part of our major tentpole CLE events through the family law section of the LA County Bar. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing to add to our toolbox to help the family law community and its practitioners. As uh, Abbas just hinted at, uh, I've been given the honor to announce that next year this program will be live, meaning everything that we've all come to love about this program, not just the materials and the information that we get, but the food and the camaraderie with our colleagues and other judicial officers, it's going to be fantastic. It will be a full day program, 8.30 to 4. And we it will be, you can mark your calendars now, the last Saturday of July. So that means July 27th, 2024. So make sure you mark your calendars now for that. It will be something not to be missed. Um, uh, uh, I'll give also a shameless pitch for the Daily Settlement Officer Program at Stanley Mosque. Uh, if you are a LACBA member and have at least five years experience in family law, we need you. The program needs you. Uh, your cases need you. Uh, whether it's you, your partners, or your qualified associates, contact me at slc at coeltilaw.com, and I will make it easy for you to get into the program. Um, finally, uh, August 19th, uh, next month, Saturday, Please don't miss the installation of officers for the family law section. It's going to be a very, very entertaining evening um, and uh, promises some musical performances from folks that you may not expect, including a couple of surprise guests that you will want to be able to say you were there. Uh, and with that, Abbas, thanks very much. I thank you. Thank you very much, my friend. Um, <laughs> We're looking forward to August 19 and installation of officers. Uh, Karen, are you here? Karen Gatton is president of Iranian American Law Association. I'm happy that she's here and joining us. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here. I was honored when Abbas contacted me and asked me to say a few words. I just wanted to share uh, IALA is alive and well. We're very excited to be part of anything that Abbas puts on. He is a legend in our community. Um, going back to anybody from <clears throat> my mom and to my generation. So he spans all the generations. And as we were discussing his cases, he's now doing international work. So I'm just really proud and honored to know him. <clears throat> proud and honored to know him and see him truly as a role model and a beacon of light in our community. Uh, we're excited about all the things he's gonna be doing. As for IALA, I'm the new incoming president. And of course, what are we known for? Really fantastic parties. So <laughs> you guys have to make certain you attend. I know you're all missing the uh, fabulous luncheon that I know happened every year. We throw great events. We have scholarships for students and we work very hard to network um, with other cultural groups as well in order to make connections. Uh, again, my name is Sharon H. Batan, and I have been in practice for 23 years. My law firm is California Legal Counsel. We do personal injury, criminal defense with a great flair, and uh, we're very proud of the uh, judgments and settlements verdicts that we have obtained over these two decades. Again, it's a pleasure to be here. I am at your service should anyone need anything. And if I can add to anything, I also do a lot of hosting and moderating. So I'm here at your beck and call. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sharon. Welcome and congratulations for all of your success. Now, in this part of the program, we start normally with uh, Gitu Bhatia. He is uh, uh, Gitu and we, we, I think we started this. If you if you read this article of uh, in Daily Journal, which was, uh, which uh, it was uh, put in, put right now on the chat room, I believe you can see it if you go there. And uh, if I am, if I can see if I can open it. 
Yeah. If you go there, you will see a history of this event and how it was happened. Ellen wrote it, and you will see the role of Gitu Bhatia in that. He is the president of the Associ California Association of Psychologi Psych Psychological Association of California. Uh, Gitu, will you please uh, continue with your part of the program? Thank you, Abbas. And um, I'm not the current president of LACPA, the Psychological Association, but I was in 2015. But thank you for um, leading us, being our fearless leader in all of these cultural competency programs. And I'd like to welcome everyone else to the 11th cultural competency program. And um, I would like to just outline what we will be talking about and what you will be taking in with the two interdisciplinary panel discussions, followed by a lunch with the family law judges where the lunch is actually not present mm -hmm. <laughs> and will be in the future, hopefully. Um, but we're so grateful for all the judges to have generously committed to supporting this program over all these years. Um, the overarching theme for today is trauma. Um, our understanding of trauma started with hearing about PTSD in the context of wars. Trauma and traumatic experiences can come in, the, in many other forms like domestic violence, child abuse, serious accidents, medical trauma, um, disasters, etc. cetera. Uh, there are some common factors that um, increases one's risk for trauma, domestic violence, and so forth. Um, and that is gender, socioeconomic status, immigrant status, ethnicity, and disability. One form of trauma that often gets neglected, unfortunately, even our diagnostic manuals do not recognize racism as a form of trauma. So we'll be talking about the unique psychological impact of racism and how it can lead to trauma. Racial trauma is similar to these other traumas I mentioned, but it's also different. Uh, for one, there is no post-trauma period. It can be a daily experience for some, and there's definitely a cumulative effect. Um, it's also not easy to detect trauma as a layperson. Um, Dr. Bortel today will be helping us understand the ways in which it shows up and how to help. Um, you will hear of personal and professional experiences from all our speakers. What we know um, is racism impacts and creates traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, et cetera. So we're hoping to address three different layers that increases our cultural understanding. Competence is a word that we've talked about we may need to change um, because it's not that we're incompetent, we just always need to be learning. Um, the first layer is often what most people come to the conference about is learning skills. We know from research that people of color censor themselves when speaking with white professionals. I would also, like to say in all humility that a person of color, a professional of color is not always equipped to deal with differences either. Uh, we all make mistakes. So how do we engender trust? How do we bring up the subject of culture? What do we do with that information? How do we initiate conversations about diversity and race and talking about differences early in the process? The second layer is uh, increasing our knowledge about trauma and culture that increases our cognitive empathy for others. But the most important layer um, of cultural competence starts with examining our own beliefs, values, attitudes about these subjects. Um, I urge you to have a notepad next to you through this day um, to search yourselves for subjects that make you uncomfortable, register your own biases where you might not be objective, uh, as I said, we'll all make mistakes along this path. And sometimes we feel that similarities with our clients can be helpful, um, but they can also be harmful, just as differences between us and our clients can create barriers and mistrust, but they can, when you acknowledge them, can also create openness 
to exchange of thoughts and ideas. So hopefully you have a great day of opening hearts and minds today. With that, I'd like you to, um, to open the first panel, Diana. Good morning, everybody. And my thanks along with everyone else who I'm sure will be thanking uh, Abbas and Carmen for doing so much work on this program to put this together. Um, I'm Diana Martinez. I'll be heading up your first panel. I'll be moderating your first panel. And um, we're gonna be talking today about domestic violence across cultures and what we need to be mindful of and where we can learn and what we can do to make ourselves more aware um, this panel was a learning experience for me as well, um, as, as my practice is primarily focused on out-of-court resolution. I, I am a family lawyer and I do uh, mediation and collaborative and consulting, any and everything to keep families out of the litigation process. So I don't, well, it's not true that I don't um, uh, encounter domestic violence, coercive control issues. Um, I learned so much from this panel, um, and our focus is really going to be on the impacts, how, how certain um, biases have been normalized, and how that has impacted domestic violence, and how we can be more culturally aware. I'm going to go ahead and have my panel introduce themselves. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, Alice LaViolette, and if you can please just tell us a little bit about yourself, Alice. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Diana. Um, I started working in the field of domestic violence at Women's Shelter in Long Beach in 1978. And um, in 1979, after a brief uh, study that was done looking at women who left the shelter, we found that over 80% of the women who had received shelter services returned to their perpetrator in, uh, within a year uh, for a lot of reasons, certainly back then as well, but uh, a lot of them certainly are true now. Um, but so we, we decided to start a program for perpetrators and in 1979, uh, I was asked to do that. And so I've been working with uh, victims of domestic violence since 78, perpetrators since 1979. Um, and I, I do a lot of, I do expert witness. I have a private practice and I um, do training uh, nationally and internationally. Arathi, do you wanna introduce yourself as well? You're muted. Clicked on mute and it didn't do it. So um, <laughs> good morning, everyone. My name is Arathi Vossen. Um, I'm so pleased to be here and I wanna really thank Diana for um, including me and uh, the Iranian Bar Association has had um, our organization here a couple of times. And, and so it's really um, a pleasure to be here and a lot of work I can see and, um, yeah, just very pleased to be here. Um, I uh, currently am a senior managing attorney at Family Violence Appellate Project. I represent domestic violence survivors uh, appealing their court decisions, um, often family law court decisions. Um, and generally we focus on things where the trial court didn't get it right. Um, so that is a particular uh, perspective I'm, I'm bringing here. I also was a trial attorney in family law, largely representing survivors, both in private and uh, legal services practice for about a decade, and also um, have been a domestic violence counselor in a shelter. So um, I'm excited to have this opportunity and this audience and to hear from everyone else um, and, and looking forward to uh, talking about these issues. Jody. Good morning. I would also like to thank everyone to be here today, and it's an honor to be here and, and talk about all, all these issues. 
Um, I am also a senior managing attorney at Family Violence Appellate Projects. So I'm not going to repeat what Arthi said regarding what we do there. Um, in addition to that, for my background, I um, was a legal director for a nonprofit for a decade, um, representing survivors of domestic violence in trial court um, in Pennsylvania. Um, and I've also practiced in um, New York as a prosecutor in um, New York City, um, so handled domestic violence cases there. Um, so um, really my legal, legal career has primarily been representing survivors in um, different trial and appellate proceedings and both on a civil and criminal side um, of things. And I've also authored some articles on domestic violence that have been in law journals and other journals. Um, so really happy to be here today and, and talk about culture and how that um, affects and impacts domestic violence. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Commissioner Nord. Good morning. Um, thank you all for, thank, thank the, the program for inviting me and I'm thrilled to be here to present and I'm super lucky to be presenting with these phenomenal co-panelists. Um, who I've known, I don't really know them all, but, but I know them from reputation. So um, it is truly my honor to be here. Um, I just passed my eighth year on the bench, um, which is hard to believe because I'm only 25. Um, so, but it is my eighth year on the bench. Uh, I do have a home court down in Stanley Mosque. Um, and before that, I was a family lock practitioner for almost 20 years. So I have seen all sorts of litigation from both sides, especially in family law with self-represented litigants, uh, represented litigants, um, and obviously uh, ex lots, of, lots of domestic violence cases. Um, I've, write ex I've written extensively um, on domestic violence in the Daily Journal. Um, I've taught on domestic violence uh, and with a, um, colleague when I was up in the Antelope Valley, we actually started a program to go out to high schools to talk to high school students about domestic violence because we were seeing large numbers of high school students who were either filing for subject to restraining orders or were being prosecuted in the juvenile system for domestic violence related offenses. And we realized they just didn't know what domestic violence was. And it's really easy, you know, with social media to get themselves into it. And within a two and a half year plan and a two and a half year period, unfortunately, COVID got in the way and put an end to mass uh, assemblies. We had talked to almost 50,000 students across the LA County, um, just explaining to them all the things about what domestic violence included, how to get, how not to get yourself in trouble, how to avoid it, what are the symptoms, what are the signs to look for, both in your relationships and your friends' relationships, and where help is available for them. So I am thrilled to be here today and to work with these fine presenters, and I look forward to, this, to doing this presentation. Thank you all. So I'm going to go ahead and share um, my screen. Um, bear with me for just a moment because I only have the one monitor, um, so I need to get it set up. Slide show, and let's go ahead and play. Um, so one of the areas kind of, that was a great segue, Commissioner Nord, because one of the areas where we need to kind of focus is how we define um, culture when it comes to domestic violence. So we kind of understand some of the more basic um, in terms of gender, in terms of ethnicity, we've even talked about age in the past. When we're talking in a, in a uh, domestic violence context, what I learned from all of you is we really need to expand that definition. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Rathi, if you can lead us on this discussion on how we define culture within the domestic violence context. Thank you, Diana. Do you mind going to the next slide? Fantastic, thank you. Um, is it showing to everybody as a full slide or is it showing in presenter mode? Because it's showing to me in presenter mode. I'm not sure. Presenter mode. Yeah. 
I'm going to take it off of that. Okay, let me go ahead and stop my share for a second. Anyway, so I can that, get this. That's the least of the things. So I, um, so first of all, I wanted to thank Dr. Batia because I think she really framed um, what we're talking about today in a way that I think connects deeply with what we are hoping to do with this panel, which is to expand the conversation when we think about culture. Um, I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian here and say that I don't think there's anything that, such as cultural competency. Uh, we talk about competency in the context of um, legal practice. You know, are we competent to provide legal services? And I don't think we ever get there when it comes to something like culture. Um, I think we can increase our awareness. We can increase our knowledge, but culture is organic. It's not monolithic and there's not like a standard or a baseline that we can achieve. Um, so while, you know, it's a common term and I'm, you know, happy to use it in this context, I, I just think it's important that we not ever get to the point where we think of ourselves as being competent. We don't have to think of ourselves as incompetent, but I don't know that we ever reach this, this level of actually being competent um, as, as competency might imply. Um, so these are some of the common aspects of culture that we've tended to think about. I would also add, of course, um, and, and Dr. Batia mentioned this as well, and even Diana, you know, we talk about age, we talk about uh, socioeconomic status, geography, um, uh, ability, disability, um, language, which sometimes ties in this, immigration status. So these are sort of aspects, I think, that we have um, become better about in terms of thinking about um, how it might impact uh, not only the type of domestic violence that might occur in a situation, but also how someone who experiences domestic violence or who perpetrates domestic violence might act. Um, and so because of that, I think um, we sort of have created these systems where, you know, we have about 15 or 20 power and control wheels, right? So there's power and control wheel for immigrants, power and control wheel for um, uh, different groups. And we, we've gotten better a little bit about understanding that, you know, something that might be domestic violence in one situation um, legally uh, is may not be seen as domestic violence in another situation because of certain aspects of, of culture. But what I think we want to do today in part is to also expand that definition and recognize that culture, even if you are looking at it in terms of race, religion, or any of those things, does not happen in a vacuum. And Dr. Batia alluded to that when talking about racial trauma. Um, we have so many events in our lives and we have other things that we consider culture. There's a, a list here of a few of them and some of them may be, you know, more frivolous than others. Some of them are very serious, but to um, not include them as cultures that we have to include in our awareness and to think that these cultures don't also affect our traditional notions of culture um, is, is, I think, to miss out. It not only misses out on intersectionality within those groups that we've talked about, but it misses the societal impact um, of these other cultures on how a domestic violence survivor might not only experience violence, but might seek out the court or not seek out the court or seek out help or not seek out help. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in a changing environment. Uh, we're going to talk about sort of general societal perceptions about domestic violence, but it, we can't do, we can't uh, dissolve that. I won't say divorce. We can't dissolve that from uh, these other cultures. And so I think it's important um, for us to look at that. And you can see this um, to a certain extent in the way we look at what might be legal culture or even family court legal culture. And that's something that we're gonna talk about. Um, one thing that I found very disturbing and I don't have the exact citation for it, so I apologize, but um, I read a report um, a little while ago that said that the um, United Nations had declared, I believe it's the United Nations had declared that um, there was a state of emergency for LGBTQIA folks in the United States because of all the backlash and not even backlash, the like ongoing uh, uh, homophobia, transphobia, um, uh, heterosexism and things like that that are happening. And to act as if that somehow doesn't have an impact on a 
how a person who is LGBTQIA and experiencing domestic violence experiences it and accesses the system, I think is um, it's it's a blind spot for us, and it's something that uh, we need to open our eyes to. Thanks, Arathi. And and to that point on the LGBTQ side, we're actually seeing a lot of that now at local uh, government levels. Um, uh, Chino Valley Unified School District is going through some things. Um, the Temecula School District um, with the, quote, protecting our children by requiring parental notification that literally I'm getting daily reports on that because we were part of the CVOSD until we moved to Long Beach. Alice, um, if you can talk a little bit about the LGBTQ plus um, side of what uh, Arathi was talking about. And I, and I want to piggyback on what Arathi was, was saying, because uh, I think I like the term cultural humility better than cultural competence, that we, we just keep learning and keep our minds open. In terms of LGBTQ plus uh, in the community, I would just say a few things. One is that when I got divorced in 1980, I was told that if anyone knew that I was a lesbian, that I would lose my children. And that it hadn't mattered that I'd been an at-home mom, that I would still lose my children. That has changed, but every time oppressed groups move forward, there's a backlash to that. As, about the time we start to relax, there's, there's a backlash. And so uh, what we're seeing is certainly uh, more hate crimes. And we've seen that in, in LA County. I will also tell you in terms of services, sometimes in shelters, if someone comes into a shelter and they identify as lesbian, um, and by the way, uh, transgender folks have a whole different set of issues here, but, um, it's not the staff that tends to be problematic, but oftentimes the other women in the shelter, uh, there's homophobia and minimizing, um, and oftentimes minimizing about the kind of violence that happens between gay men or lesbians uh, in terms of size differences. <laughs> you know, what the one that's bigger might look like the uh, oppressor or the uh, perpetrator. Um, even the um, even the ability to tell people that that's happening in your community. I'll tell you that I had a man fly from Sacramento to see me uh, because he was a member of a very fundamental church. He was an up and coming person, and I'm not saying this. I'm saying that in the Republican Party, he was someone who was up and coming. He was also married and had children. And he was terrified for anybody to know because of the, uh, of the for him, not only the, the personal danger, but being ostracized from his entire community. And one of the things that um, I thought was really interesting because we moved from LGBTQ plus also to gender is that there was an article in Time Magazine that was very interesting a few years ago, and it was from transgendered men. And they said, we never knew how hard we had it as women until we became men. They said, our accomplishments are magnified, our mistakes are minimized. It's been easier for us to get, to get uh, promotions. If they were in academia, it was easier for them to get grants. And um, that and there was one, one attorney who was a uh, transgender male who said, and I never realized how badly people talked about women in court, including female judges, until I was in the inner circle. I would also tell you that services, just in terms of, um, I do um, men's groups. There are about 100 uh, DV perpetrator men's groups in LA County. Um, there are probably less than five that say they are LGBTQ uh, sensitive. So um, the services are not there at the same level. 
um, much more so certainly in better women's shelters. Uh, but the transgender community certainly struggles because, uh, well, you know what's going on in all kinds of areas with transgender folks and sports and, and in all kinds of areas. So, uh, and I will tell you one thing with, uh, we had a very sensitive judge for many years, a DV dedicated uh, judge in Long Beach, Judge Andrews. And she called me and she said, Alice, we have a transgendered woman um, who was convicted of domestic violence as a male, was socialized as a male, and is almost entirely through uh, the surgery to become female and looks like a female. And we don't know where to put her, but we think because of her socialization and because of her um, being convicted as a male that we need to put her in a men's group. Can your men's group deal with this? And so I spent uh, the group talking about what it's like to be different. How we, can we accept people who are different? Will this person be safe in our program? And that kind of thing. And she came in and I would have to say that the guys in group did everything but give her uh, coupons to the car wash and act like the welcome wagon because they were, very conscious of being judgmental since they already felt judged. Thanks, Alice. And a lot of this, I think, comes from a, a lack of a, the lack of awareness that we're talking about and, and being able to properly define culture within the domestic violence context. Um, Commissioner Nord, a lot of that comes through this normalization through various venues. You were talking about the high school and having to explain what it means, what domestic violence is. Can you talk a little bit more about that normalization? Yes, thank you. So we can talk about cultural understanding on the micro levels, which is, you know, ethnicity, religion. Um, gender, um, sexual orientation, but I took this um, and made it more expansive to see how, how a culture uh, uh, looks at or can normalize domestic violence such that it no longer or becomes, de minim uh, becomes minimized in its effects on people. And, it, and the article I wrote was really about how does media um, music, movies, television, start to normalize domestic violence such that we see it so much on TV, we hear it in the songs we listen to, that it starts to become accepted behavior, or at least acceptable behavior, or behavior that we can justify by using words like locker room talk, that we start to, to dehumanize or the victims and just say, well, this is just what goes on. And it's really not that big of a deal. And um, some of the things I pointed out um, in the article I wrote that, 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 um, that, that uh, accompanies this program was, I, I mean, I'm of a certain age. I grew up watching TV and I grew up watching the Honeymooners on reruns and I Love Lucy on reruns. And, you know, Ralph Cramden, his go-to uh, you know, action and his go-to line was to threaten to uppercut his wife, Alice, and send her to the moon, right? If you watch the show and you understood the show, you realize that, that Alice was no pushover and could give it back to Ralph Cramden just as good as she could take it from him, right? Um, she was uh, Audrey Meadows did, was no was no uh, wilting flower on that show, um, and you did. And, and if you didn't really understand that there really was a true love affair between them, but as a child growing up, I didn't recognize that. Right, you don't recognize that. I grew up watching I Love Lucy, and quite often, even though they were married in real life and they played a husband and wife on TV. Desi Arnaz as Ricky Ricardo and Lisa Ball as Lucy uh, 
would he would spank her when her when things would go awry. And as a child growing up, here you see a husband spanking his wife for bad behavior. Starts to normalize it. This is what adults do. It must be okay. What you don't see is Lucille Ball was actually the, you know, one of the geniuses behind the Desi Lu company. She was a formidable businesswoman in her own right. But you never really see that part of it, right? You don't, children don't see that part that she that this is TV and this is not how couples behave. Um, I also mentioned, you know, songs like Tammy Wynette's Stand By Your Man. Um, she wrote that about her husband, George Jones, who was emotionally and physically abusive to her. He was a raging alcoholic, extremely violent when he was under the influence of alcohol. Um, but she told Amer she told women, stand by your man, because after all, all the bad things he does, he's just a man. Take it. Just take it because that's what women do. They stand by their men. And then I kind of fast forwarded to even modern times. I mean, uh, the accolades for the um, police song, um, Every Breath You Take. If you take out the music, it is literally an ode to stalking. We get it every prom, every wedding or lots of weddings. That was people's song to dance to. Right. But it's got nothing to do with love. Even Sting, who wrote the song, and at one point it, it counted for a vast part of his income, said it's not a love song and it has nothing to do with love. Um, you know, and then even if you fast forward even more, um, I pointed out to um, Carrie Underwood's song, Before He Cheats. And she's singing about, she thinks her, her partner, her, her husband or boyfriend is in a bar cheating with a girl. And she sings about a laundry list of things that she does to his car. Basically lays it out. And everyone's like, oh yeah, that's you know female empowerment. But if you flipped it and a man did that to a woman's car, would they say that's the same? Right? Um, so how we do things and if we add a backbeat to it and a guitar riff and a catchy melody, are we now starting to normalize it? And I also obviously pointed out, mentioned um, John Wayne, who everyone grew up watching Sunday mornings. He often would, as they said back in those days, manhandle women, right? It was domestic violence by, by just a different term, but we would say, well, the Duke did it and he's Americana, so it must be okay. And my, my overall arching sense of this is by putting these things on TV, by putting these things in music, by putting a backbeat to them, we are normalizing them. And I'm not even gonna get into because there's been hundreds and hundreds of articles written about um, uh, hip hop and rap music and how that has played into possibly creating a culture of domestic violence against women. Um, that by constantly putting this music out there, by constantly singing about it, acting about it, um, writing about it in these ways, we are starting to normalize such that culture will start to shift. And as, as the other panelists were mentioning, you start to see where it's starting to say, well, it's not that bad. It's against an LGBTQ person. Well, it's not that bad. It's against so-and-so. Well, it's not that bad. And we are degrading because we are normalizing. And if you have somebody who, and again, I'm not trying to get political, who is literally on TV, on a recorded conversation saying how he sexually assaults women. And then people are justifying it saying it's locker room talk. How can we not degrade how domestic violence occurs or why it occurs or the normalization of domestic violence through media? I know everybody after this is going to go and check their playlists somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> as I pointed out, I mean, um, yeah. the song Fun, which was with, with Janelle Monet, won Grammy of the Year for, uh, for won Grammy Song of the Year. And the entire song is him asking for forgiveness for a, a domestic violence incident that he gave to his girlfriend. And the entire song is I'm in a bar and talking about getting drunk and I'll take you home tonight and don't worry about it because I've been apologizing for this scar I gave you. Song of the year by the Grammys. Yeah. <laughs> so there's multiple layers 
here. Um, and Jody, you um, you had used a great analogy and um, to kind of reflect on how all of this is connected. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Thank you. Um, there's a bunch I I was taking notes, so there's a bunch on my mind right now. But um, specific to your question, I, when we were talking about culture and as Arthi was saying, um, a lot of times the it, 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 there's focus regarding ethnicity, race, age, um, gender, et cetera, which are so important. And and then there's also these other lying other cultures and how they impact um, um, how we impact survivor's experience in the legal um, system and the court systems and the court personnel handling of cases, um, practitioners handling cases, et cetera. Um, so the first image for some reason that came to my mind was the, the nesting dolls, because I remember taking dolls apart, um, the dolls apart as a kid, and you take it apart and there would be another one, another one. And um, when, we, when we're working with someone, whether we're a judge, whether we're a practitioner or attorney, um, whether we're a psychologist, um, it's really um, seeing all those layers of the person and seeing all those layers of culture um, and how they impact our experience as someone interacting with that person because they do impact how we interact and see and how we make decisions and also how their experiences have been impacted. Um, so I think it's real important to that constantly evaluate um, and, and be mindful really of people's cultures and both um, their individual cultures and the wild, wider culture that they're in, and then also our own interaction with culture and our cultures and what they mean to us. Um, one of the um, articles that is on one of the slides is an interview with um, James Hunter, who wrote Cultural Wars, um, and it's a political article. And, and one quote, I read it yesterday, and it just kept coming back to me, was um, culture provides the justification for violence. Um, I'm just going to say that again and pause. Culture provides the justification for violence. And um, when we look at stuff and we think about, um, you know, white supremacy, rape culture, patriarchal culture, um, those have really provided justification and perpetuated violence within our society. Um, and if we look specifically to, to family law and domestic violence and, and rape, you can look at um, some things that have happened historically and really, um, and then also what are present day and really see how that piece com comes in where culture can, can be used to justify violence um, regarding things. Um, and specifically, just, um, just a couple examples of that um, for um, when we look at that rape culture, like 17th century, the, the Lord Hale's jury instructions were rape is an accusation easily to be made and hard to be proved and harder to be defended by the party accused. Um, and so it just really takes out of context what actually rape is. It takes out of context um, how trauma impacts a survivor is telling of a story, a retelling of a story, and it takes out of context what has occurred and puts in this notion that women are not to be believed or someone that's been raped is not to be believed, that um, they're discounted and that um, the other party is to be believed. And we see that in gender bias studies that have been done um, uh, across different states, many state courts um, in the 80s and beyond did studies and that has come up and again and again where women are not found to be credible, um, self-represented litigants in particular, um, and domestic violence survivors are not seen as, as credible as uh, other litigants. Um, so that the idea, again, is this overall thing that we can't divorce out all the isms in our culture, the racism, the sexism, et cetera, um, out of our practice as practitioners, um, when someone's in, in the courtroom and when we're working with someone outside the courtroom, inside the courtroom, because they impact the decisions that are being made um, and how we're presenting things. And I think I, I want to give a really personal example of how that, that 
culture, whether, you know, the broader American culture, the global culture, and also the courtroom culture impacts. Um, my, my sister's a survivor of domestic violence. And before I got heavily involved as a practitioner representing survivors, um, at that point, I was a prosecutor still, she called and said something had happened. Um, and it and led to going into the court system. And um, we were in court for her to get a restraining order or protection order against her then husband. Um, and I, I obviously did not represent her. I was in the audience um, listening and watching. And when the hearing was done, the judge said to my, my sister said, well, you have no broken bones. So yes, like I believe that abuse occurred but I'm only going to give the or, uh, you an order for six months. Um, and, and the judge went on to say, I have people coming in here that have broken arms, et cetera, and you don't have any broken bones. And that statement said to my sister and every other survivor in that courtroom that only certain types of violence or only certain types of abuse deserve a longer order of protection or deserve protection. And that's what happens when we look at culture that justifies violence and how it can impact survivors as they are in the court system. I'll stop there because I know we're at. at uh, you, um, Diane, you if I could just add one thing to, I'm sorry, Diane, if I could just add one thing to Jody, what she said there is, um, I'm, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I want to add on to what Jody said is, as bench officers, we have to be very cognizant not to judge um, injury by looking at the parties, but not judging this person was injured so much and this person was only injured this much, so therefore it's not as bad as domestic violence. And we always have to be very cognizant that injury is not necessary. The, the, the physical injury or the how big the bruise was or the actual broken bones is not how we should ever judge domestic violence. And, um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I can add sorry. one other thing? Um, Oops, hold on, because I, I know Arthi wanted to, to say oh, something. Sure. Yeah, um, um, so first I just want to echo what Commissioner Nord said. I hear this with lawyers all the time. They'll say, no, this is a really severe case, or this isn't as severe as some others. I mean, I get that it's not as severe, and I think that sends messages to our clients. It sends messages to um uh, people around us, it sends messages to other lawyers that it's okay to um, really look at it in those ways and that we are the best judge of what's severe and what's not severe. But what I, I did want to say just quickly is, um, you know, we're giving these examples and, you know, if you're of a certain age or of a certain generation, maybe they resonate with you. Um, but, and people can talk about, oh, well, you know, Big Little Lies came out and now we have Colleen Hoover. And so, you know, there's all these really positive messages about how domestic violence is bad, but these are not recent things that are happening. Jody talked about her personal experience um, and we see it right now. I mean, I, we just got a published opinion in a case where um, a judge had said that the survivor didn't act like someone had told her that they were going to kill her. And so they didn't think she should get a domestic violence restraining order. And thankfully, the appellate court has reversed on that. But that just happened. So we can think we're post-racial or post-gender, you know, oh, that was 1700 or that was the 50s or the 70s or whatever. No, it's right now. It's still happening right now. Alice. Well, I was just going to say I've been around. I'm a little older than everybody else on the panel. Maybe a lot older, I'm not sure. Anyway, um, I've seen it very cyclically. Um, in the 70s, we made great progress. We had the restraining order law, we had diversion come out, we had all kinds of things. Um, and there has been, uh, we had domestic violence dedicated courtrooms. All of the, we've, we've seen things kind of go backwards and we've got dual restraining orders now. Um, and with the, with the desire to give shared custody, oftentimes we, we overlook what's actually going on and what is in the best interest of the children. And I would just say that, that um, many women, and I've seen this more with women than with male victims, many women are, are minimizing what happens to them because they are afraid 
that if they say too much has happened, they'll be charged with failure to protect their children by DCFS. And what happens now is we've got minimizing of actually what's happening so that you don't look too bad um, because if you look too bad, and the other thing is that angry women in court, and by the time you've got a domestic violence case that goes to court, oftentimes the person who's perpetrating it is looking pretty chill. They can look pretty cool, but the other person is pretty angry. And I think we shouldn't, women are judged differently in court for being angry or anywhere else for that matter. Um, and so I think it becomes really important for us to, to look at how we judge each other. And as I said to one uh, 730 evaluator, let me ask you something. If you did everything the court asked, if you paid all your fines, if you did your programs and, and um, you got one hour more a week with your children, would you be angry? And she said, well, yeah. And I said, well, why do we expect people in these adversarial situations not to be angry? And taking it into that, that court context, um, there's been recent laws that impact um, domestic violence and specifically within a cultural context. Um, Jody, do you wanna lead us through that discussion? Yeah, well, I think that um, when we were talking before, I, one of the things that came up was really looking at, at again, looking at that broader culture um, in our courts and, and even looking in their political system in our, in our courts, but specifically when we look at our the Supreme Court of the United States right now, there was a recent decision, um, Counterman versus Colorado, and we don't want to, I don't want to get into um, really the, the holding or anything, but just a few facts to give some context. Um, Counterman sent um, hundreds of Facebook messages to CW, who's a singer and musician, um, and the two of them had never met. Um, CW never responded to the message and even tried to block Counterman from sending messages, like changing her, blocking him several times, and, and Counterman just would create new Facebook accounts to start. Um, continue messaging CW. And interesting enough, the Supreme Court, when you read the opinion, actually characterizes the messages, saying some are utterly prosaic. Others suggested that Counterman was stalking CW, and a number expressed anger at CW and envisioned harm befalling her. And I think that context is, is important when we then look at the actual oral arguments. We want to share a clip regarding the oral arguments and transcripts up there. And it's this chief justice asking questions. Um, and um, let's play the clip and then I'll just um, talk about it for a moment. Hopefully it will work. <laughs> Can you play that clip? Is it not playing? I don't hear it. I think you have to share sound if you haven't done that. Okay. Let's see. No, I haven't. I haven't done share sound. Um, do you know where I find that? Sorry. I usually just hit play and it plays. So nobody was hearing it. No, unfortunately, no. So, um, I think with your screen sharing, when you go into screen share, there's a thing where you have to share audio. Let me see. I'm going to go over here and make you shoot. I can't make you co-host. Can you? It's, it's part of the share screen thing when you click on the share screen as a co-host it says share audio and so we should see here. here share sound got it yep oh geez now it's wanting me to restart my audio application the heck sorry folks Let's see if it'll let me do this asking me for a password. I hope we can't get it over just in the interest of time. Yeah, um, go ahead. That, I mean, hearing it is obviously uh, really powerful because of the Chief Justice attitude. Um, in, in my opinion, when you hear it, you can hear it coming across, but basically the Chief Justice really, um, really dismisses what was happening and, and the messages and actually, 
that is like there's one in the message where staying in cyber life is going to kill you. And the chief justice says that you can see that in the transcript and literally says, I can't promise I haven't said that. And then the courtroom, a um, number of people you hear laughter, uh, laugh in the courtroom. And um, it really, to me, showed how much um, stalking behavior or domestic violence behavior can get discounted in the, in, in the courts. Um, and a lot of it, particularly when when things are taken, not looking at the full context of the picture, like here, the chief justice, you know, what, what wasn't being said again was that there were a hundred messages that were being sent, that this person didn't even know CW, that CW tried to block and Counterman kept sending messages. And the justices themselves said that some of the me that messages were angry and even that they were going to that befall harm on her. Um, and I think it Jody, again goes, yeah. I think, I think Arathi's going to try to play it from her speaker because I do think it's really an important piece if we can get okay. that to work. Yeah, because it's even beyond that piece of laughing. So let me let me see if I can do this and hope. Sorry, it's telling me I have to install something through Zoom, and I've never had to okay. do that before. My standard coming very close to that standard isn't the sort of speech that this court has protected under the First Amendment. So well, saying doesn't come close to a protected speech. Here's one of the statements for which he was convicted: "Staying in cyber life is going to kill you. Come out for coffee. You have my number." In what, in what way is that threatening, almost regardless of the tone? When it's put into the context, Mr. Chief Justice, what is being said here is if you don't come out for coffee with me, bad things are going to happen to you. There's other oh, this is, I'm sorry, this isn't remotely like that. It says staying in cyber life is going to kill you. I, I can't promise I haven't said that. <laughs> come, out, come, come, out, come out for coffee. You have my number. The content. I think that might sound solicitous of the person's de development. I mean, if, if we're talking just about what the statements are, how is that, what tone would you use in saying that that would make it threatening? The threat in that is. I think that, I mean, really highlights how it's just joked about in our society. And, and for survivors, it's, serious for CW is serious um, and really just wanted to point that out that we have this again this broader culture that is infiltrating into decisions into interactions with each other um, where um, domestic violence stalking behavior sexual assault are are discounted um, another area where we we've seen this just briefly too is is uh, like the me too movement um, where um, women and others were speaking out regarding sex abuse that occurred to them, sexual assault, sexual harassment. Um, and there's, um, by some people argue that there's been a backlash to that with um, um, perpetrators of the violence, people that have committed the violence actually then um, suing the survivor for defamation. Um, so then the survivor has to defend them because the survivor spoke out about the sexual assault, the sexual violence, and now they're being sued in court because they spoke out about it. Um, so that, again, is a culture now that that can and does and continues to do silence survivors. It has a chilling effect of silencing survivors and then speaking out about what has occurred if they so choose to speak out. Um, and it also has a culture of where we're accepting the violence, going back to the quote I said earlier, and not holding um, individuals accountable for the violence that's happening. Thank you. Thank, I think that was really impactful, Jody. I'm glad we were able to play it. Thank you, Arathi. Um, Commissioner Nord, um, you were talking a little bit about a different culture in terms of the um, gun culture and a few cases that uh, you were talking about. Can you share that? Yeah, um, obviously, it, when we're looking at domestic violence and we, we're tracking these cases, Counterman is really interesting. Um, because it really talks about uh, the level of threat that needs to be made for, and, and that was a criminal case. Um, and Justice Kagan is the one who ultimately wrote this, the decision on behalf of the court. Um, uh, and, and we don't really have to, because domestic violence uses a lesser standard of preponderance of the evidence, we can, we can read in more to the words that someone's saying 
and how it's being taken um, as compared to a uh, beyond a reasonable doubt standard where they're looking for more. Um, the party can obviously testify, I was afraid, this threatened me. And then obviously when you're sending hundreds of hundreds of text messages, that in and of itself is disturbing someone's peace. Um, especially when you've told them to stop and you block them and they go out and keep forming a new accounts and then keep starting over again. Obviously, you know, the, the, luckily uh, to the date, they have not raised the standard for domestic violence. And so under most scenarios, that conduct itself would be enough for a domestic violence restraining order. Even on that, rather, um, if you could go back one slide, the, the even on the one that where he doesn't really, the threat isn't directly to the person, like where he says staying in cyber life is going to kill you. I would theoretically ask the party, what did you think this meant? And they said, if you don't stop this, if you don't meet me in real life, I'm going to kill you. I, to me, that would be sufficient. Um, there are things that are said over you know, uh, I always point out the uh, 12 angry men, I'm so angry I could kill you statement where you don't really mean it. It's just things that we say to each other. But again, in this situation, this person with, with the context of how all of the text messages were coming or the direct messages or the postings through talking uh, through uh, Facebook or however they were being sent um, would probably be enough. I think for most domestic violence courtrooms. Um, I think our bigger fear right now is on the Rahimi issue, because um, um, we're really concerned about how that's going to end up with respect to firearms and the ability of the courts to take away people's firearms. Um, if the court, if the Supreme Court, uh, which has taken up that case, decides, no, you cannot take away people's firearms, um, even if they are a domestic violence abuser, that's going to be a sea change. Um, and so that I think is what we're, you know, and, and obviously Bruin, you know, obviously that comes out of the Bruin case and we're really trying to keep our eye on where that's going to go and how that's ultimately going to impact, um, the domestic violence protection act, domestic violence orders going forward, taking away firearms, ordering people even temporarily to surrender their firearms. Um, and so that, that right now, obviously poses a much bigger concern, um, going forward. Uh, it's, it's, it, it could, I mean, it could be a monumental shift in how domestic violence cases have, uh, go forward. And I'm sure Alice has been dealing with this for, you know, can go and talk about this going back to the 1970s and, and domestic violence and weapons and all of that. Um, and probably, so if you want to add something there, Alice, I'm more than happy to have you jump in there because. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, what we know currently is that uh, about 60% of mass shootings are perpetrated by people who also um, are uh, involved in domestically violent situations and perpetrate domestic violence. So that the connection is important. But I wanted to piggyback on what you said, uh, Judge Nord and, and uh, Jody and Arthi and, and Diana about context. And I'm, I don't wanna jump in and on you. Are you, are you finished, Judge Nord? I didn't wanna. Uh, oh, no, I'm, you know, I, I was just gonna, yeah, I'm, I'm I, on this topic, I, I, I was gonna throw it. That's why I was, I, I know you want to talk about this a little bit and um, carrying out the threat and all flows into what Jody was talking about. Well, you know, the, there are no profiles of perpetrators, but there are ranges of uh, violence. And the uh, and Jackie Campbell's uh, lethality assessment. I mean, one of the things that tends to be different is not only if you use a weapon, but if you actually are holding the weapon when you threaten somebody. And we like to find that out when we're uh, doing our initial assessment, our assessment of dangerousness because guns are easy. Guns are impersonal. Uh, in most domestic violence cases where there's a homicide, um, a gun is the weapon that's used because you can use it from across the room. You can use it um, and you can use it impulsively. And we work with a lot of people who are impulsive. So, uh, you know, I mean, I definitely have my own opinions about guns in this country. <laughs> But uh, 
we, we really worry about them with domestic violence. And I think in criminal cases and other court cases, when somebody's career involves uh, the, like a police officer, or highway patrol or something, there have been ways that people have found around that so they don't lose their career. So I think there are always ways around legally around things that uh, so people don't lose their careers. But I think it's really something to pay attention to because most domestic violence homicides are definitely and and severe injuries are around guns. All right, see, we were um, talking during our, our prep in terms of the neutrality that is necessary. Um, and and also talking in terms of, of context, you want to lead us through that discussion a little bit. Yeah, I think one of the things that we see, and you'll see this in the the Vincent p opinion that that we posted, where the court talks about how they could have provided more assistance to the uh, unrepresented litigant in terms of helping develop the evidence, which is already something that um, has been stated in, in uh, Ross v. Figueroa, but it's something that um, still seems to be a problem, this idea that somehow if you are not um, equal, you're not neutral. And I think we need to get away from that. Uh, we're courts of equity and equality is not always equitable. Um, we have to take into account the totality of the circumstances. That's one of the requirements under the Domestic Violence Prevention Act, right? Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that totality of the circumstances is, oh, you know, this person's a good person. That's not really nice for them to have a restraining order against them. So let me see what I can do to get around it, right? Um, we have these, you know, these binaries that we create with like, oh, they're a really good parent, but they committed domestic violence. So it kind of cancels each other out, right? It's it's sort of one of these, and and again, not to get political or too too extreme, but it's sort of like there, you know, there are equally good people on both sides, right? You cannot um uh, ignore facts um uh if you and still be well, sorry, let me restate this differently. It's not being um uh, biased to ignore facts, right? And I think sometimes we we think that, um, and we do this with clients too, because we are anticipating this is what's going to happen in court. Um, there are lawyers who tell clients, don't talk about the DV, you know, like kind of like what Alice was saying, or talk about it only in this amount, because the courts are going to um, uh, think, oh, that you have a motive for it. So when we come in with these ideas about how people should behave if they are abused or how people should behave if they commit abuse and they don't match these preconceived ideas, we are bringing bias into that picture and that is not neutral. Um, we have a legal culture when it comes to domestic violence that starts with these assumptions about motive and bad faith. And that affects survivors in and out of court as, um, Jody was mentioning, these are not private courtrooms. People see what judges do to other litigants and they know that that could be them or they use it to extrapolate to their own situation or they hear what happens to somebody else. So what happens in the courtroom isn't just affecting the litigant that's in front of the judge at that moment. It's expecting everybody that's in that courtroom and people who will then talk about what happened in that courtroom about their experience or the experience of others. Um, there's a, a case that came out in 2021 in Ray Ma V, it's a dependency case, but it's also been requoted um, to a certain extent in, in um, some opinions, including a family law opinion, KLVRH. And it says, you know, in discussing perceptions of credibility, we expect victims to be sweet, kind, demure, blameless, frightened, and helpless, and not multifaceted people who may or may not experience fear or anger. These preconceptions that judges bring with them into the courtroom, these are preconceptions that judges bring with them into the courtroom when they assess the veracity of a victim witness story. And we encourage diligence and education to guard against such preconceptions. That's 2021. And we've had decisions that cite that in, as recently as 2020 to 2023. So this is not new. This is not um, um, something that it has uh, 
we're over, or, you know, now that we've had more training, it's, it's gone, it's still happening. And it's because we want to put people in boxes. It's easier when someone deviates from a box that we put them in to say, no, you know, you didn't do this. So let's just say no. Um, and as human beings, we want to compartmentalize, right? So um, these things influence survivor behavior and how abuse manifests itself. Um, and we need to be aware of that and, and not think that just because we were um, able to, um, Sorry, I just got distracted by a chat. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> and, and and not think that um, uh, just because we are assessing credibility that we're not bringing preconceived notions and implicit assumptions into that idea of what credibility means when you're talking about domestic violence. And yes, I will put that site in the chat. Sorry, Rathi, that was for me. Somebody requested the site. Um, Alice, we've we've now heard a couple of times now through this talk about um, studies. You've mentioned studies, and and you raised some concerns about that. Well, um, most of the research on domestic violence, or a lot of it, was done using the conflict tactic scale. And as um, Jody and Arthi and and uh, Judge Nord talked about, context is everything. And that was not used. And so just real quickly, it was originally, um, uh, the conflict tactic scale was originally used. It's a list of aggressive acts. And when we were talking about kinds of, of domestic violence, it went with, with what's called uh, mild aggression, which was hitting, pushing, slapping, grabbing, that kind of thing. And then went to severe aggression, which was considered kicking, strangling, uh, punching, use of a weapon. And what they were looking at the impact of corporal punishment. If you were corporally punished as a child, would you be more or less likely to uh, be aggressive as an adult or to, uh, you know, or to accept aggression? And I don't know about the rest of uh, everybody else who's here today, but I'd like uh, you all to think about whether you were corporally punished as a child. I know I acquired a taste for soap when I was a kid because uh, I got in trouble for, for bad words like liar. Anyway, um, so, so uh, that, that taken into account, a thousand men and a thousand women were asked, they were called and asked, have you ever done anything on this list in the course of an argument with a partner. And 50% of men said they had done that. And nobody looked at the other side of it. And uh, until the OJ Simpson trial, and then they found that 52% of the women said they had done something physically aggressive to a male partner because they ruled out LGBTQ folks. Um, they didn't ask, why did you do it? They didn't, was it a, a self-defense? Did it come out of um, an escalating argument? Uh, did it just come out of nowhere? Uh, they didn't ask what the result was. Did you, um, did you injure the person? Was fear created? Uh, is there a chronic apprehension in this? Uh, what happened as a result? They didn't gender the acts. So women were seen as more severely aggressive because they kicked more frequently. That research, um, which got a little better, but never really looked at context. And context is everything when you're looking at domestic violence. Thanks, Alice. Um, Jody, if we bring it down to now our practices um, and with the role of judicial officers, given the current attitudes in domestic violence, do you, what are the concerns at this point? There's a lot of concerns. I, it was interesting. I happened to, um, a, a colleague had sent out a, a podcast um, just yesterday from the Modern Law Library. Um, and it was with a, a woman that was um, looking at flaws in family court, should family court even be abolished? Um, and 
um, had done research on family courts, their origin, and some of the historical pieces there, um, and um, talked about, you know, originally family court was designed to fix children and, and their families, and particularly families who were different from the proper American. Um, and there were um, also studies done way back in, in the um, 1913, there were some in 1913 and the 2030s that already showed that um, in dependency courts, um, black children were being the most affected, black children were being the most affected, like uh, about a 1 40th of the population were um, black or African American identified um, individuals, and yet one eighth of black girls and one eighth of black boys were um, from going in front of the court. So the, the population disparity. Um, studies today show that in dependency court, um, Black children are four times more likely to be in the dependency system, even though their population overall in the United States is much lower. I mean, I bring this up because um, it goes back to what we were talking about generally, the, these culture these culture pieces, patriarchy, racism, rape culture, these other cultures, um, can you know they they impact all of us? Like Arthur was just talking about, that we all have um, biases, unconscious biases, as practitioners, as as attorneys, judges, psychologists, and um, the the concern is that we're not um, really, um, in my opinion, fully fully dismantling it, confronting it, and looking at it in in ways that are going to improve the system. Um, and uh, you know, it's akin, I think, think to what happens um, with with racism in this country and the enslavement of, of people. That we don't want to talk. By, I shouldn't say we. I, I, there, there are people in this country, um, and I'll speak. I'm a white woman. Um, you know, my ancestors that you that don't want to talk about it, saying it's you know it's it's done. We're complacent. We don't have to talk about it anymore. Or there's this movement to to ban books on it classes on etc it's the same with the family court system we not we we you know knowing the origin of it and unpacking that and really looking at how does that affect decisions today and what's happening i think is really key that we can't divorce these cultures and subcultures that are happening out that we really have to it's a comment upon each of us as individuals to really slow down and pause and and really look at how is my cultural background impacting the decisions I'm making as I interact with my client or as I interact with these litigants in front of me? How is, um, you know, how, if, are there any biases that I'm bringing that's impacting it? And what's kind of getting in the way? You know, there's a great study real quickly by, um, I should say an analogy that Rebecca Campbell uses. Uh, she, she's done work on the neurobiology of, of trauma, particularly sexual assault. And just real quickly, like sexual assault survivors are expected to tell, and, and, and this is works for uh, domestic violence survivors as well, even though the study was specific to sexual assault, expected to tell their story in a linear fashion. In our courts, that you know, it has to be told linearly, and when it's not, someone's not credible. And you talked about when you have trauma, alcohol is not involved, that everything's encoded in your memory, but your ability to then put it out linearly gets affected. Imagine, if you will, having posting notes and everything that um, Diana, Arthi, uh, Commissioner Nord, Alice and I said, this whole presentation, you had to take and put your notes on sticky pads of all sizes. So you have a whole pile of sticky pads about everything we said. Someone comes in and turns a fan on, all your sticky pads go flying everywhere. And then someone comes in and says, put all those sticky pads in order. And if you put them in order, I believe you. Well, that's what we expect sexual assault survivors to do. They have all those memories, but because of the trauma, their memories are scattered. So they have a hard time putting them in order. But our culture expects it to be linear. And, and Robin, I, I, Rebecca Campbell is the one that gave that analogy. And I use that a lot because I think it's helpful to think about it. Um, so for me, like that, that's we really have to look at historically how courts came about, historically how um, racism impacts this country and what uh, structural racism has done to this country. Historically, what has, what, you know, what white supremacist characteristics am I carrying in when I work with a client as a white woman 
or what if you're a judge, what 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 cultures are you bringing into the courtroom that might be impacting things? And and as we do that, I think and really pay attention to it and slow ourselves down, I think then then we can start, you know, looking more and seeing survivors and crediting violence in a way that this country is has not done. I think that legal culture is is a big part of the challenges that we face. And for me in our prep, <clears throat> talking about you know, family law and when we talk about the parenting plans, the child custody and visitation and that legislative goal of 50-50, because I, I talk about that in my mediations when I'm working with clients. You know, that's ultimately what we wanna work towards. And there's so much that's missed there. Alice, do you wanna talk to us a little bit more about that? Well, just also real quickly to piggyback on what Jody was saying, that women, even um, when they're not as traumatized, tend to talk more in context. And men tend to talk more, and I'm generalizing, in discrete incidences. And um, we used to discuss the fact that evidentiary law was biased against women because of the way we talk. Um, but one of the things that I, I think is kind of a good guideline for the courts or can be helpful is the whole notion of the precursors to the hostage syndrome or the Stockholm syndrome, which you can see a lot of parallels with domestic violence. And the first thing is the perf that a person who is a victim perceives a threat to their physical or emotional well being. But the second thing is that they believe that the person is capable of carrying out that threat. The third thing is the perception of kindness, which of course in a stranger hostage situation is different. But in domestic violence, domestically abusive relationships, there is kindness. I mean, people don't get together with somebody who's one dimensional and doesn't have kindness or some empathy for the most part, okay? So, so the perception of kindness on the part of the pe perpetrator is there. And you hear that over and over from uh, victims of domestic violence about how this person is good with this or took care of me when I was sick or that kind of thing. One of the big things for the court to look at is the monopolization of perception. And that's when the victim of domestic violence stops seeing the world through their eyes and sees it through the eyes of the person who perpetrates the violence so that, that they wind up speaking as if they're the defense attorney for the, uh, for the perpetrator of domestic violence. And I've seen that with people, even people in extreme areas of uh, where they've been extremely abused and never touched. They were never physically abused, but they were so messed with, with their minds. They were so gaslit. They were so uh, threatened that they uh, they were in uh, that they they started really saying, well, I didn't understand this till I saw through his eyes or her eyes. And then the, the last thing is the perceived inability to escape. And you see this a lot in family law when people are talking about if I if I go to court, I'm going to lose 50 percent custody with my child. And how can I protect my children or my child? if I'm not there 50% of the time. So I think that's a really important kind of framework that we can start to look at um, in domestic violence cases. Thanks, Commissioner Nord, and from the, from the bench, can you talk to us a little bit about what you look for and what you've noticed with, with various cultures um, in terms of the bringing the court into the process? I wanted to add on to something that Jody had said. Uh, she was talking about <clears throat> different things. One of my uh, one of my favorite things I always hear is the restrained party says, "Well, they never called the police, so it couldn't have been that bad." I, I, I'm not quite sure why people believe that whether or not the police are or are not involved, it suddenly is is or is not domestic violence, but. They always say, well, I, the police came, but I wasn't arrested or the police did that. You know, they never called the police or defense uh, part attorneys always respond, uh, representing restrained parties. Last time, well, you didn't call the police and you could have called the police. Right. And you had your phone. Right. And I, you know, and I'm like, well, that's not really 
resolving the issue. That doesn't make it, that doesn't mean it didn't occur. Um, and I often point out, because um, I've had people say to me, well, you're just, you're just going to grant the restraining order because they're a female or I'm, I'm the male and we always lose. And I, and I point this out all the time. And I've pointed this out to um, new bench officers when they ask me, how do you decide what to do? I said, we don't judge gender. We don't judge ethnicity. We don't judge, I don't care if you're red, green, purple, blue, polka dot. I don't care what your religious affiliation, your sex. I judge conduct. And that's all I'm looking at. If the conduct is equally bad, it doesn't matter who perpetrated it. It's all about the conduct. And that's what I look for. Um, and if it's if if it's a man committing it against a woman, or a woman committing it against a man, or if it's a same-sex relationship, the conduct's the same. And that's all I'm looking for. If and if you all you have to do is just close your eyes and go, is this conduct? If it was if the situation was completely reversed. Would you still grant the restraining order? If the answer is yes, well, then you're then judge. Then you're not. If, if you have to say, well, no, because if it, if this happened to a man and it was a woman, I wouldn't grant it. You're not judging the conduct. You're judging their gender, right? So you, we always have to be very, very cognizant of the fact that we we are not judging that. We have to judge conduct only. Um, and I, I wanted to add a little. And I, I agree with Alice what she was saying is um, one of the reasons you know people do stay in these relationships is fear of losing their children, right? Why did you stay? Well, he, he, you know, so-and-so said, if I leave, I can leave, but I can't take the children with me. Or I would, or they wouldn't let me take the children with me and I couldn't leave the children in that situation, which is a common reason why a lot of domestic violence abusers continue to stay in domestic violence relationships is for fear that the children won't be able to go or the domestic violence abuser um, won't let them go with them. Um, and so, uh, that is a huge issue that we are always cognizant of, which is obviously why 3044 is in existence to try and combat that issue, which is to get the children and the domestic violence victim away from the abuser, um, such that they cannot have that joint legal custody or joint physical custody to continue to exert that control over the domestic violence victim. And again, also, I want to add something, uh, also on what Alice was saying about, uh, monopolization of perception. So when people come in um, to remove restraining orders, first, we always make them have, they have to identify themselves. And we always ask them to provide a, a driver's license to make sure they are truly the victim and not some third person that the, that the restraint party got to come in and file the paperwork. But I always ask them, is this something you want to do? And I always, if the if the restrained party is there, I always watch to see how they react. Where do they stand? What do they say? Are they standing right behind the restrained person? In essence, the restrained person is like, yeah, I think this is what I want to do. And the restrained person is standing right behind them. It leads me to believe that this is not something that they want to do. And it's not their desire to do it. But their, but their perception of what they need to do has been monopolized. But again, even though the restraining order was in, pla in place, that person got to them to try and get them to overturn it. So we always have to be very cognizant of how people's conduct is and what happens in court. And um, I know we're kind of running out of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll cut it off there. And that's just something you wanted me to specifically address. But I wanted to add on to the insights that both Alice and Jody said and, and how we see those things. Yeah, I want to make sure we leave some time for yeah. questions because we do have a couple that have come in. Um, and I, you know, you all know that I, I really like to focus on some solutions. So just real briefly, um, when I was in Vancouver, we, uh, there was a judicial officer who talked about, a, in a criminal matter, a young First Nations uh, gentleman who was in their criminal system and was becoming quite the repeat offender and elders from, from his tribe um, asked if they could take, take over dealing with this young man. And this judicial officer did allow that and um, was even invited to participate. And that's when they started seeing some changes. And you had talked about people from, you know, who go before the court kind of in violation of um, their own cultural um, uh, norms. 
bringing in a US court system or a California court system. Um, and so I do like to talk about what are some of the things that we can do or be more mindful of in terms of how do we create some respect for these cultures um, within that diverse uh, um, domestic violence context. And so I'll go ahead and start off with, um, with you, Scott. Yeah, I mean, um, I mentioned, uh... One thing is obviously to recognize the domestic violence. I had mentioned that we did this domestic violence program and we had reached out to a school district in a rather affluent area. And the, um, the, the supervisor of the school district told me, we don't have any domestic violence here. Well, clearly that's obvious. I'm like, that can't be. You're telling me out of all the high schools in the entire state, in the entire country, you suddenly have no domestic violence in your school. And he's like, no, we don't have any of those issues here. I said, no, what you really have is the affluence to, to hide the domestic violence, not that you don't have the domestic violence. So I think recognizing that there are issues is the first step, obviously, realizing it, not hiding it, not being afraid to, to tackle it head on is the first step. Education, education, education is the first step. And as I always pointed out, yes, maybe a lot of the students in their class won't have or won't be subject to the domestic violence or had domestic violence, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to come across somebody in their life who is going through it. And because they've been educated, they will be able to help that person. They will be able to recognize that, that they are in a domestic violence relationship because they had this training and they can help their friend or their roommate in college, or whatever the case may be. The other thing is obviously cultural issues. This is when we go down to the more macro level. Obviously, there's very insular communities um, that do a very good job of hiding domestic violence and hiding, and I'm not talking about not just physical domestic violence, but lots of forms of domestic violence, and they do a very good job of hiding it by keeping it insular within their communities and not letting it get out. And so those people who are in those insular communities feel even more trapped because not only can they know that if they raise this issue, not only does it cause a whole bunch of problems just for themselves, it will become a community issue. The community will be upset with them. That they brought it out of the community, that they're airing their laundry in public, and this isn't something we do, could end up with shunning, being ejected from the communities. And so it, it's really a, an issue when we try and figure out how to deal with these really small insular cultural communities with respect to domestic violence to both educate as well as protect the domestic violence victims and allow them to feel that they, even in these communities, they can seek help. Thanks. Um, and we are running out of time and I did I'm want so sorry. to open up. I, I, okay. <laughs> I wanted to um, open up some questions. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask Alice to, to close us out, but um, uh, Carmen, how do we have somebody ask a question if you're still there? There was one question that I wanted other people to ask. What is the, then someone asked, what does the panel think about the court so often getting wrong DV requests? often get wrong DV. I, I'm a little confused I, by the question. Are you saying the courts get it wrong or they get... I think, with, I think the question is false DV requests. Oh. So I'm, I'm curious as to what the panel thinks on that issue. I, I think that it is very difficult to make a DV request in the first place. And I have worked on a couple cases where I thought the, the DV requests were false but overwhelmingly they are not. It's not like it can happen, but it feels to me like uh, when it happens, people generalize it to most cases instead of looking at, you know, I, I, I just don't, I, I mean, I interview people pretty thoroughly and I don't think these requests, and I also think women's fear is different than men's fear in general. And, that when we look at fear and, and vicarious trauma, we have to take that into account when women are telling their stories um, and male victims and shame. So with shame as a, as a factor as well, I don't think most people are willing to jump into DV accusations. 
unless they're true. They hesitate, even in criminal now, cases. Can I just add something to that? Go ahead, Arthi. Um, and I think that just from the perspective of a, of a lawyer also as a practitioner, we have to be very careful about what kind of culture we're contributing to when the first thing we do when someone has a DV claim is alleged that they're doing it to get a leg up for custody, they're doing it to get it for immigration status, they're doing it to alienate the parent from the other child. This is not to say that that never ever happens, but to act as if that is the majority or that is the baseline, and then you have to disprove, you're guilty of those things until you prove otherwise, is to be completely against not only the public policy about domestic violence, the legislative intent, and the language of the law, but you have to really wonder, what are you doing? You know, I mean, where's your own ethical compass in this? Because that's what happens to people, and it happens to all victims of domestic violence, right? They come in having to disprove that they are not lying or that they are not doing this in bad faith or that they are not doing this for something that has something that they are supposed to not have anything to do with um, domestic violence. And there's another opinion. I'm sorry, I keep bringing these opinions. It's Jody's case. Um, and it talks about how anger and fear are not mutually exclusive, right? The fact that you filed your domestic violence restraining order at a certain time doesn't necessarily mean you're lying about the domestic violence or that you can't be afraid. And yet we use that as a criteria all the time to question motive. And that is one of the things. 3044 was put into place in part. The way that 3044 is put into place is to take time so that you do not rush you go through the factors. It's like a checklist, you know, Atul Ruande is the checklist manifesto. You go through and by doing a checklist, you help interrupt your biases about these things. And that is an approach that we need to sort of take in general is that we need to be interrupting our preconceived notions about these things so that survivors have the opportunity to make alternative choices if they want to. Maybe they want to come to court. Maybe they don't want to come to court. Maybe they want a restraining order. Maybe they don't want a restraining order, but they want a finding of DV and be able to make those choices and change their mind. Because we have so many great and they need to change. And, and as judicial folks and courtroom people, we need to also be able to change our mind as the evidence changes. We have, some, we have some really great comments coming in. I wish we could get to all of them. This is clearly a topic that so many have passion have, about. If it. we can do it in 30 seconds, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Can you explain on that, this acronym? Alice, you want to take on that one? <laughs> okay. So we were talking about music, and Judge Nord was talking about all the music. My favorite Prince song, When, when Doves Cry, the whole music video is him slapping people. Um, but uh, I love Aretha Franklin. And so we were trying to come up with something. Um, just off the top of my head, I said, how about respect? Because, uh, you know, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, say those words it means to me. If, if we're respecting culture, if we're respecting our own limitations, if we're looking at our own bias, it's all about respecting the people that we work with. So I think, is, is that it? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> My thank love you. of Aretha Franklin started it. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I want to just say thank you to this panel. You guys were really incredible in, in putting this together. And um, it was a learning experience for sure. Well, I just, you know, in confirming what Diana said, it is absolutely amazing just how these 90 minutes. I used to sit there and I couldn't leave it. Just, you know, the one issue after another and very, very informative, very relevant. And uh, how really we all need to educate ourselves. We are going to have a, uh, I think, five to 10 minutes break. So you can get a cup of coffee or glass of water if you want. Five minutes. And then we are going to come back at 10.30. Uh, Bill, do you have a, something to add before we go off the screen? And uh, Carmen will play us the music for the sponsors. 
Uh, the only thing I'd like to add is uh, how impressed I am with the panel, the topic, and the presentation itself. I, I, I think the panel went into a number of areas that we uh, generally take for granted, uh, both as practitioners and when we're sitting in the audience listening to these cases uh, that come before the court. Uh, I, uh, quite frankly, would like to have uh, met all of the panelists before today. I've, I've, I've met uh, Commissioner Nord, but uh, the others, I'm just really impressed. Outstanding. Absolutely. And then there is something is brought up, and I didn't know that you guys are going to talk about it, but the fact is that in the very highest level of judicial thinking and decision, at the very, very highest level, we need education. We need insight. Because you are a judge, because you are a justice, because you are an appellate justice, because you are a member of the Supreme Court, it doesn't mean that you are immune from cultural issues. We all need it. And we all, and this is not disrespect for the judicial judiciary, that this is questions that we have as a human being. How can this justice face this issue and make this ruling? On that note, thanks again. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, she has to leave us. Thanks to the panelists. And uh, please mark your calendar for next year. We're not going to leave you alone until, you know, we're going to get together. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, please, uh, let's just wait, wait for the next panel. Thank you. Arthi, great to meet you. It was truly my pleasure to work with all of you. Yeah, Jody, thank you. Great to meet you all. Thank you. Yeah. Sharon, I look forward to being in touch. Bye bye.
I assure you, if we were together, we would have some Spanish breakfast or coffee and tea together in the background with this background music. And next year, depending on what would be the theme, imagine that 1030, what you're going to get. <laughs> Nothing is well, just substitute for that would be the next panel. Every panel is just my you know, dear, close to my soul and to adjust this panel will be uh, equal. Uh, we have a surprise of this panel. I was just, you know, I, I have to say that. Uh, Judge Goodman been part of this practice for almost 10 years. Uh, also Judge Porus really from the very, very, very beginning. But we are honored to celebrate today our colleague, ex-mediator, uh, panelist, as the new judge in our family law system. And uh, with that, I would like to give microphone to Bill to say a few words and then to Gitu to start the, the file. Bill. Thank you, Abbas. Uh, good morning to the next group of panelists. Uh, it is uh, with great honor that I get to, to speak about a little bit about each of you. Uh, which is very interesting because we have all presented on panels and on topics and at seminars before. The only difference this year is that this time last year, Judge Goodman was honorable. Now she is the honorable. So we've <laughs> got to put the the in front of honorable because she has now put on a new hat. Uh, we miss her dearly from being one of the organizers of of this event, which she's done. Judge Fuente Porras has also been one of the organizers. And Dr. Batia, uh, I, I don't know that we have enough words for the three of these uh, individuals. And uh, welcome and uh, love having you. And it's nice to say the Honorable Judge Diane Goodman. Thank you, Bill. I think. Um... I would also add that Dr. Linda Bortel has been the part of the organizing committee for this whole time with us. So I am really delighted now to um, introduce this wonderful panel that we have today. And we will start with Dr. Linda Bortel, who is a clinical psychologist in private practice in South Pasadena. She specializes in treating child trauma victims, co-parenting, families, and high conflict divorce. She serves as a parent coordinator as well. She's a past chair of the PAC Board of Trustees in Division One and Seven of CPA, the California Psychological Association, and is a past president of LA County Psychological Association, the San Gabriel Valley Psychological Association, and the Wright Institute Alumni Association. She has been involved with Rose City since the beginning and serves on the training committee. Um, next, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Poonam Graval. Poonam Patel Graval is an attorney specializing in special education law, criminal defense, and juvenile criminal defense. With a background as a deputy public prosecutor and private practice, Ms. Graybell brings a wealth of experience to her legal career. She holds a degree from Brown University and a doctor of jurisprudence from California Western School of Law, where she received an academic scholarship. She's dedicated um, to advocating for vulnerable children and families navigating California's public education system and the juvenile delinquency system. Her commitment has had a significant impact on both legal fields, leading to notable results for her clients. She's recognized for her expertise in special education and in juvenile justice. She has had the privilege of working closely with former California State Senator Gloria Romero on legislation aimed at protecting juveniles in the criminal juvenile justice system and on operating charter schools to support improving educational opportunities for all children. In addition to her legal accomplishments, 
Ms. Graybell has been honored with the Patriotic Employer Award for her commitment to hiring veterans, demonstrating her support for those who have served our country. In her private practice throughout Southern California, Ms. Graybell continues to provide exceptional legal representation, leveraging her unique experience and expertise in special education, law, criminal defense, and juvenile um, criminal defense. Um, then I'd like to introduce Judge Puente Porras, um, who has been part of um, you know, our audience and presentations over the years. She was appointed on June 27, 2018. She served as a commissioner for the Los Angeles Superior Court since 2015. She's currently assigned at Vidier Courthouse in the Southeast District and is the site judge. Vidier Courthouse has five active courtrooms and is the only family law hub for Los Angeles County. She has always sat in a family law assignment. Prior to her election as a commissioner, she practiced family law, representing all parties and served as an appointed minors counsel. In the contested adoption forum at Edelman's Ch Children's Court, she was appointed on behalf of parties or to serve as minors counsel. Her practice also included criminal defense and civil litigation. For 10 years, she served on the board of trustees for the Southeast District Bar Association and was president in 2010. Her pro bono work including, included serving as a daily settlement officer for the Los Angeles Superior Court, um, the Alliance for Children's Rights, Los Angeles, and the Public Law Center in Santa Ana. Judge Puente Porras was in private practice for 17 years until being elected to the bench as a commissioner. She's a graduate of Western State University College of Law, Fullerton. Um, now, our dear friend, um, Judge Diane Goodman. She was appointed by Governor Newsom um, to the Superior Court in 2022. She was sworn in as a judge on February 25th, 23, and is currently sitting in family law assignment at the Michael Antonovich Antelope Valley Courthouse. Prior to becoming a judge, um, Diane was the owner of the law um, and mediation office of Diane Goodman in Encino. She's a past member of the California State Bar Law Executive Committee and the past chair of the Adoption Subcommittee of Flexcom. She's also a fellow and in a um, a past president for the Academy of California Adoption Lawyers, Academy of California Family Law Formation Lawyers. Judge Goodman is the author of the Parentage Chapter of Practice under the California Family Court, published by CEB. Judge Goodman has handled many complex parentage issues as an attorney, and she's spoken about that on our panels. Um, including acting as co-counsel in California Supreme Court decision regarding the rights of lesbian parents. Judge Goodman was an AV rated attorney for Martindale Hubble um, and was also elected as a super lawyer for um, the Los Angeles Magazine 2009 through 23. She received her JD from uh, the University of Laverne School of Law in 84. She received her MA and PhD in depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute. Um, this makes her particularly a great um, speaker for our today's presentation on trauma. Um, she is going to be speaking about different aspects of trauma, but I wanted to get us started with Dr. Linda Bortel, who will share her slides um, to talk about what um, trauma is. It's a word often overused and, and inappropriately used. So Dr. Bortel, please get us started. All right. So I, I wanted to start with this quote by Huxley. If most of us remain ignorant of ourselves, it's because self-knowledge is painful and we prefer the pleasure of illusion. Um, and I know that we have heard it this morning, but you will hear it again 
that it is very, very important that we kind of strip away some of our defenses. That's not me. I don't need to know this. I don't need to study it. And really take a hard look inside yourself about what you think of the other, what you know and don't know of the other, and what that means for you in your professional capacity. So this is an African proverb that relates to earlier slide. You can't lead anyone further than you've gone yourself. So if you wanna be able to recognize some of the manifestations of trauma in the courtroom that we may see as bad behavior or not caring or not engaged, um, you have to understand it yourself. So <clears throat> as Dr. Batier said, trauma is a word that is so overused. I So much trauma, drama, trauma gets inter interwoven with pe some people, but trauma is really specific you know, in a psychological perspective. And it is an emotional response caused by severe distressing events. Um, I listed some of them, accidents, violence, sexual assault, terror, or sensory overload. And those can all cause trauma. And I think it's also really important to think about how much trauma, where, so, but everything that I said, and there's other things that cause trauma earlier, child abuse was mentioned, but these in here, they can all be included in the divorce process. They can all be part of what happens inside of people as they are the ones initiating a divorce, as they are the ones getting served, as they are the ones moving, all of it. Um, and as the DV uh, panel brilliantly pointed out, the study of psychological trauma must constantly contend with the tendency to discredit the victim or render them invisible. So trauma does impact clients in the courtroom, all of them. And you need to be mindful of the different ways that it can manifest. Um, so I just put here, and I, you know, for, for those of you that have been around for a while, this is a review, right? That's race, ethnicity, culture, SES, um, <clears throat> abilities or disabilities, and when they were acquired, age and generational influence, orientation, previous interface with the legal system, and neurodiversity as becoming more and more, um, more is known about it, whether there's a, a kid who's very neurodiverse or whether one of the parents is. So I put some examples of some of the patients that I see on a weekly basis. Um, and I think it's important to look at it and say, wow, and then you layer trauma on top of that and how much is there to contend with? So a Russian client adopted as a toddler lives in a Mexican family in Glendale. So she also really identifies with the Armenian culture. Um, a white client who strongly identifies as Italian, if she was just seen as white, um, if an attorney looked at her and said, oh, she's just white, that she you know, doesn't speak Italian fluently, that she didn't live there for the first several years of her life, that she didn't, um, that she doesn't, uh, th that she's very invested in cooking and the culture. Um, a mother who's a physician and a father who's been unemployed for years. And I just want to see if that one hits anybody in a certain way, um, because a lot of times the assumption is, well, the father might be having a more high powered job. <clears throat> and what does that mean in terms of when you would see them in court? And then if you're putting trauma over that, what if you're putting trauma over a mom who's an ER physician? What if you're putting trauma over a dad who has a lot of shame and guilt over being unemployed for years? A client who limps due to a recent domestic violent injury versus someone who was born with a physical um, disability and how they feel about how they move in the world and how they're seen in the world. If you have a client who is never involved in the legal system and and she would always she was going through a divorce and she's like, I don't like this scary paper, the scary numbers on the paper. Whenever I see those scary numbers, down the side of the paper, it makes me scared. And she would get so sort of hyper aroused that it was hard for her to focus and even read what was on the paper. Um, gay clients who feel like they may not be treated fairly in court due to discrimination. Um, 
an ADHD client who won't finish tasks given by the attorney and doesn't remember information. And you know, does the attorney just get really angry um, or does the attorney understand and try to redirect or engage in executive functioning in a way? <clears throat> so how can we recognize trauma? It, it, it manifests in so many different ways with people. Um, when I was in graduate school, I spent four years working on the National Child Abuse Hotline, and we would get over a half a million calls a year um, about child abuse. And I was always struck that I would have people who would call who were very ritualistically abused for many, many years and say, well, I saw this show on TV and I thought I'd call and see what you guys do in a very blase way, very high functioning. Um, I don't know if this really impacted me or not. And then the next call I would pick up in the next second would be somebody who would say, you know, I had an uncle who one time touched my breast over my shirt, over my bra, and like their whole life is defined by that. So it impacts different people in very different ways. So, if, so trauma, they can have a lot of difficulty with authority figures, and that would be all of us on this call right now. So um, there can be drug, drugs or alcohol and they can feel ashamed about that or not make the connection that it's really about the trauma. There can be a lack of interest in activities they used to enjoy, inability to imagine a positive future for themselves, physical pain that migrates throughout the body. Um, and I always like to ask people where they carry their stress. Now, there's some people who carry it in their stomach, some in their lower back, some in their shoulders. You know, do they get headaches? Like, where do things manifest in their body? And is their body trying to tell them something about what's going on? So not seeking help and they don't want to even think about the abuse or acknowledge it. I've worked with several people who've been involved in um, lawsuits against the Catholic Church, and many of them, particularly the men, did not want to recognize that um, the sexual assault that had been done to them was child abuse. Um, overwhelming fears of, of fear, despair, guilt, self-hatred that is pervasive throughout their life, maybe underperforming their whole life, signs of depression, trouble concentrating, thinking the world's much more dangerous than it is. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, flashbacks or nightmares about the abuse, outbursts of anger, agitation, and irritability, and that can be hard. I know sometimes when I'm working with severe trauma survivors, I get yelled at. I get yelled at more than I do for my 17-year-old at home. <laughs> um, so, and but I know it's part of what they're dealing with. Being startled by loud noises or surprises seeing, hearing, or smelling something that can trigger a memory, emotional numbness, jittery or always on alert for danger, not being able to trust others. Um, the DV people said this, forgetting parts of the traumatic event, or you know, when she was talking about the post-its all over the place, I frequently refer to it with clients as like raindrops falling down. And like a raindrop might have a snip of a memory and they're like, that can't be true, can it? And then maybe there'll be more raindrops and then maybe it will be like a waterfall. And then we can look at the puddle that's on the ground and help to make a, help to make um, a, a more memory and put it together. And that's the brain protecting the person. Like it'll come to you in little bits. Difficulty sleeping, avoiding places or situations that are reminders of the trauma, intense physical reactions to the to having any kind of reminders and procrastination. There's a lot of guilt motivated people. So it's important to know if you have a client that's going into a family law court and they, you know, that you maybe spend like a, a minute or two talking to them about their history. Was their trauma that they experienced prior to the divorce natural or man-made? If I go through a really bad hurricane, I may have a better prognostic outcome than if somebody shoots me. Um, and I'm not talking about, well, Linda, you're being shot. Like what's, what's with that? And I'm just talking about something man-made that a man does to someone else or, or a natural trauma. Was their trauma, trauma a single act or chronic and unpredictable? And if sometimes you had 
the drunk dad who came home and he was uh, he wasn't drunk and he was super nice and brought toys for everybody. That's one thing. But you knew if that door opened the next day, you didn't know what was going to happen. And maybe you'd have the very drunk father who was chaotic and very unpredictable and you didn't know when abuse was coming. Was there child was there trauma from childhood or was it more recent? Um, and is their trauma chronic? If they are still living in a situation where there's maybe lots of contact with their soon-to-be ex, that they have to see them, that they have to get abusive messages from them on a daily basis, that, that they're even ordered to pay a certain amount of support, but they refuse to, that they won't comply with other orders, what does that mean? And over time, that can lead to avoidance. So <clears throat> manifestations, like, so what do we see? So we saw the symptoms. How does this show up? So entrenched in alienation and in intense self-hatred. And like I said previously, clients will lash out at us and it can manifest as disorders of the body, brain, and nervous system. Um, I know like in the 90s and early 2000s, I was working a lot with um, teen girls who were cutting and a lot of them, they were feeling this kind of generalized, uh, usually shame within their body about something and shame is something that you can't fix. But if you cut yourself, then you can go, oh, that hurts there. That's the thing that's getting me. Um, so body, brain, and nervous system. So when I say body, it may be like, oh my gosh, this is somebody who chronically throws up or this might be somebody who cuts. Um, I want to move into racial trauma. So I found this quote by Tanashi Coates who wrote, between the World and Me, if you haven't read it, it's short, it's powerful and wonderful. It's a letter to his son. Um, but all of our phrasing, race relations, racial chasm, racial injustice, racial profiling, white privilege, even white supremacy serves to obscure that racism is a visceral experience, that it, it dislodges the brain, blocks airways, rips experience, extracts organs, cracks bones, breaks teeth. You must always remember that the sociology, the history, the economics, <clears throat> and the regressions all land with great violence upon the body. So <clears throat> I want to now move into racial trauma. And as I do this, I want you to think about, okay, so what about racial trauma? What about other traumas? What if there's an overlay? And how does that mean for how my client is able to present or how they're able um, to show that they are a good parent, but they're in a hyper aroused state? So, <clears throat> sorry. So uh, this is just um, about individual racial trauma. Following the COVID uh, outbreak in the US, there were 1500 reports of, of anti-Asian racism in one month. And the reports included incidents of physical and verbal attacks, as well as reports of anti-Asian discrimination in private business. In 2018, 38% of Latinx people were verbally attacked for speaking Spanish and were told to go back to their countries, called a racial slur, or just treated unfairly by others. Um, and over the one year, Twitter saw 4.2 million anti-Semitic tweets in just English language alone. At 4.2 million. These tweets included anti-Semitic stereotypes, promotion of anti-Semitic personality or media, symbols, slurs, or anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, including Holocaust denial. So if you're one of these groups going through something like this, you're going to feel it. I am not. I'm not going. Okay, vicarious traumatization, which can be just as bad. Um, and this is the indirect traumatic impacts of living in a place where you're dealing with racism and individual racist actions. Vicarious traumatic stressors can have an equally detriment, detrimental impact on black indigenous people of color's mental health as direct traumatic stressors. So um, I know that there's people that if if there's um, a police beating of an unarmed black man, they're like, I can't watch it. I can't, I can't do this. I've watched too many. I can't do it. 
So <clears throat> viewing videos of Black people, killing Black people like George Floyd can cause traumatic stress reactions and the people who view them, especially Black people. Of Latinx youth who immigrate to the US, two thirds report experiencing one traumatic event with the most common traumatic event reported during the post-migration being witnessing a violent event or physical assault. Um, and many Native American children are vicariously traumatized by high rates of homicide, suicide, and unintentional injury experienced in these communities. So it's important to know what, what community has your client lived in and how has it impacted them? Sorry, I am not, I'm not going forward. I don't know what happened. Should be. Okay, so <clears throat> if you look at, now we're gonna layer court over it, court culture and trauma. Um, you can be in court and, you know, we may all feel more comfortable there, but there's, it's unknown, it's an unknown culture and it has its own culture and the rules can be really different. There can be language barrier. If you're self-represented, how do you feel being in there? And there can be a stigma of even talking about getting mental health support. There's also the traumatic loss that divorce is. And so there can be loss of a marriage, of broken vows, identity, children, parenting role, your previous socioeconomic status, a loss of a trust in others. And that can be, yes, all others, not just your ex and their family. The loss of being a couple, maybe you're not invited to some parties, maybe you don't get to do things, and a loss of friends. Um, who, do your, who do your friends choose in the divorce? So looking at trauma recovery, it's important that we try to establish safety, as much safety as possible. Um, a lot of the work in therapy is really reconstructing the trauma narrative so that they can put all those post-it notes or those raindrops together and build connections between the survivors and their community. Here's some different ways to help. I just wanna say, um, you know, thoughts and prayers does nothing. Um, that it is important to be a strong ally and an ally, a new term that is coming up is civil courage. Uh, this was in an article by the American Psychological Association two or three months ago, and it's brave behavior um, with action without considering the social cost to yourself. Are you willing to step in? Are you willing to put something forth? Are you really willing to put yourself out there? So the bibliography is just included in the slides, but I wanted to end my portion on a quote from Martin Luther King um, that I really like. I love his letter from Birmingham jail. Um, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. The Negro's great stumbling block is in his stride toward freedom is not the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who's more devoted to order than justice. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is, frust is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Thank you, Linda. I think um, this was a powerful ending to a very informative way of understanding trauma in the many ways it shows up and um, hopefully we'll be all more attentive to it. One of the slides that you talked about, the multiple losses, leads me to um, talk to attorney Poonam Graval about her experiences um, going through a divorce. And you know, the thing that I think is helpful for all of us is the knowledge, but also the personal stories that people go through. So I'd like to invite uh, Poonam to speak to her experiences and losses and shifting in the role and identity that happened as an Indian American woman and as also as an attorney. So welcome Poonam. Shio. 
Uh, there you are. You're there you go. Okay. Thank you very much, Gito. Thank you so much, um, the panel, for having me. It's quite um, an honor to be a member of this panel and to share my personal story as Gito relayed. I am an attorney. I've been practicing for over 18 years in Southern California. I'm of Indian descent, um, born in England, raised here in the United States. Um, and I've known Diana Martinez for, I, I believe, almost 15 years. Um, and I've um, on a very, very personal level. And she had asked me about a year ago, I believe, if I would consider um, sharing my personal story as being an attorney, a female in Southern California of Indian descent and having gone through a divorce. Um, and, um, and I had about a year to, to think about it. So, um, so I'm very excited and honored to be here because I know these personal stories do matter. And it is sometimes very difficult to get um, individuals to talk about their personal experience in, in, in such a public manner, but I think it's really critical um, uh, that we share and we're able to do that, especially for the attorneys out there practicing family law and interacting with individuals whose families are changing, and also um, the amazing therapists that are out there and providing support to the families and the individuals going through divorce. Um, with respect to loss that's associated with culture. One of the first things that I noticed um, at the time I'm at going through a divorce as um, an Indian woman and an attorney, my identity as an attorney remained. I was also a parent, but one of the things that I noticed, and, and I have to preface this with also saying that I also had practiced family law in the past before, but um, now, being on the other side of that, what was unexpected, and I actually wrote quite extensively about it, is this other loss of, of, of identity almost. For me, it wasn't so much of a personal loss of identity that I noticed as a result of my Indian cultural back, background and heritage, but it was more of a reclassification, a recharacterization of who I was and who my children were. And one of the examples I can give is that my maiden name is Patel and my married name is, is, is Graywell. I was, it was, as I was going through the divorce process and coming at the end of that, I was no longer, we were no longer the Patel family nor the Graywall family. And I, um, I began to see as I also played an intermediary role for other Indian Americans who were going through divorces, um, that there was also this loss of family, it's the loss of their family of origin in the divorce process. And they are, that individual is bringing that into um, the divorce proceedings. So as, you, as the attorney is communicating um, with their client, what is, unique about the Indian experience or can be unique about the Indian experiences. It's a, it's a collectivist culture. And with that, the divorce has an impact on the group identity and the individual's placement in that family. And I, I certainly experienced it. I was very surprised. It was ongoing. Um, I experienced it within my own peer group. So within my own generation, which again was very surprising because a lot of my um, peer groups are second generation Indian American, but I think that's somewhat a testament to um, the, the belief systems and the, um, the, the value system in the collectivist culture itself. The divorce absolutely has an impact on the dynamics of the extended family. And so that the individual whom you're dealing with in the courtroom or in through mediation is um, Diana does, or Gitu might in her in her sessions. There's they're not just talking about the splitting of the marital relationship, the impact of that on the children, but there are other dynamics and other relationships, aunts and uncles, parents, in laws, um, and that they are absolutely impacted that, and the individual is feeling that loss of a space in that family setting. Um, and I absolutely experienced it myself. Um, one of the other, uh, one of the reasons I believe that underlying this, this additional layer of loss um, as an Indian woman uh, coming from an Indian heritage was I think there is a lack of language in the culture and that may be true for other, other collectivist cultures um, as well. 
And I think it's important to be cognizant of that. I mean, even if you are um, highly articulate and you're English speaking, many of us speak different languages. And I, I speak several different languages. And I, I recognize that there was an actual lack of verbiage and at lack of useful um, language um, that could be utilized, at least within the my Indian family background. And um, and that's that takes the that that put, that's becomes isolating for an individual when we don't have language. We we talked about that with the previous panel about how words matter. Um, so I um, that one of the one of the things that I found myself saying to even my children, I don't, feeling a need to say is, we are still a family. Things of that nature. We 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 are still a family. We're still going to have family dinner. We're still going to have traditions. And the reason that I was doing, I found myself doing that, is because there was this external um, redefinition and reclassification of who I was and who my children were in the terms of my family heritage in, in the terms of being Indian. So again, you know, I was still an attorney and Gita had asked me this, you know, how did, how did others view you? And I shared with her, I'm still an attorney and I'm still a parent um, in the Indian context, but there was this, you're not a legitimate family because you are not this traditional male, female family. So we don't really know where to put you. Um, so there's just a lot of um, room there for us to work with that. And you have to be uh, aware of that. I did not have that same experience with my non-Indian families or my non-Indian extended families or what I call um, my family. That's not my family of origin, but I had the language and the ability to, to create that. And so I did see that, um, that uh, unique difference. The other... Um, the other, the other loss that I experienced was a, a loss of support, not just a loss of belonging in your family of origin, but also a loss of support that I thought I experienced that was unique to my cultural background um, in the sense that almost immediately after, while I'm going through the divorce and even afterwards, my non-Indian family and friends and colleagues would often inquire about my support system. Again, there's language. What is your support system, Poonam? Who is helping you manage your children? Who is helping you run your home? What about your daily errands? And those types of questions, I did not receive those types of questions um, from within the Indian culture. Now, um, why? There could be mo many reasons why. One of them, I suspect, is, again, the loss of, loss of language. That's one. The, the other is, again, this is a more traditional, cult, the Indian culture, even in the United States, even within second generation Indian Americans, it is a more traditional collectivist culture. And, and once that spousal relationship no longer exists, there is this phenomenon that occurs. Is we don't know where to put these two individuals who now then you know have have um, have children, um, and so it's it can be very isolating. And those questions are not asked. What kind of support do you need? Um, the other the the other experience that's related somewhat, I think, to trauma and the idea of of loss that I. I I did believe that was unique to me, and it might be a question that Gita was already going to ask, is I saw that there was a distinction made between myself and my ex-spouse. Um, and I, um, my experience was that it, it must be it's so much related to culture in the sense of because I'm female and because I'm educated, I perhaps don't need as much support. I speak the language. I have means, I can get a job, I, I'm a female, and I should be able to nurture and care for my children, um, as opposed to my ex-spouse and other men that I've also represented in this context. Um, the, there was a more willingness um, to provide a certain level of support, um, support with their children, support in their domestic affairs, support with meals. And this distinction i it what it stood out for me because again i'm also a second generation american so i have very close non-indian 
family, basically. And I didn't see that distinction made there. And I, um, so from a cultural perspective, um, I, I did notice and experience myself that there were these distinctions, there were these losses um, that I myself experienced and in communicating and having also represented um, individuals of South Asian descent, both as a family law attorney um, and also as an attorney representing children and families in the context of um, dependency court, delinquency court, um, you get this sense that there are these other dynamics at place where you have to be, where I found myself having to um, listen more carefully um, and learn, um, as our previous judge shared, listen, learn, and take more time to understand um, the other losses um, and the other experience that that particular individual may be, um, uh, may be experiencing in while I'm representing them. So Poonam, I think um, you covered so many different wonderful topics. I wanted to capture back two things. One is that um, being a second generation immigrant, um, there are people assume there's a level of adaptation that would be protective or buffering. But in fact, research shows that second generation in many cultures tend to struggle more with the first generation and the new experiences. And so they're kind of stuck in the middle in some, so many ways. Um, the other thing that you talked about, and Abbas had also mentioned that in the you know, Middle East and so forth, women's titles are either you're married or not married. So your identity is so much attached to marriage and divorce can you know, lead to this loss or shifting of identity. And thank you for mentioning how there's a lot more sympathy, even in the mainstream culture for single men, you know, single fathers sometimes than for single moms. Um, there's just sort of, again, that's a cultural difference that you highlighted. Um, so I know that you've mentioned that you've sought therapy at different times and for different needs. What I'd love for us to hear are some pointers you have for the mental health professionals and attorneys to create the trust and credibility with their clients um, that are from other cultures. And I think the more we give space for it, the easier it gets for a person to trust, but anything that you can add to that. Um, and, and, and both in both fields for um, therapists and for attorneys, this is not an easy thing to do. And building trust, maintaining trust, maintaining the rapport. I myself, again, I'm an attorney and I deal with families. Um, it, it is an ongoing, um, it, 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 it's a very deliberate ongoing process that one has to embark upon. Um, it's not like, again, I said, it's, it's, it's not easy to do. But one of the things that I found very helpful is um, when I'm speaking to my clients, and I encourage everyone to do that, is always to check for understanding and to ask questions of like, I've given you a direction. How do you feel about this direction? What is your belief system? Do you agree with it? Not just in terms of, do you agree with me filing these documents? Do you agree with this course of action? But what is your belief about it? How does it make you feel? Um, I would ask those types of questions. Are there other individuals in your family that you need to consult with um, that you would like to take time? I'll encourage you to go ahead and speak. I know I, I will say things of the nature. I know you're coming from this background. You might want to take some time, but recognize that, um, that you're not just talking to an individual. I, that individual may be your client, but that individual does not live in a vacuum. Um, and to afford them the opportunity and the time um, to go um, um, uh, to discuss with their family and afford them the safety of speaking about that to you. Um, the, other, the, um, the other tip that I would give or suggestion I give, and I, and I think, again, this is very difficult um, um, to do in the context of 
the professional services that you are supplying, especially in terms of the time limitations and all of that. But uh, I think it's really important to make a very human connection. When the when a person of Indian, for example, person of Indian background is a uh, cultural background is coming to me, um, I may share a little bit more about myself. I am a special education attorney. I represent students and I may share just a little bit and say, well, you know, I'm, I've got two sons and they're blah, blah, blah. Asian. It's very, parenting is very difficult. And these are some of the challenges. Or um, I've also been, um, I've, I've also experienced divorce myself. And these are some of the difficulties. Or I understand I've got, I, I've got, I, I, I've got these, the following issues in my family. It, these are not very easy things to do because we have been trained to be very professional and very private and to just represent the client. But if you want to gain cultural sensitivity, cultural humility, or human humility, and humanize the process, which is in essence what I feel that we're all trying to do, then you'd have to humanize your role too, to some extent, feel, feel out those parameters and put yourself in, um, in that space with your client, whether it's the patient, the therapist client relationship or the attorney client relationship. And I think you can go quite a distance by basically saying me too, or I understand this may not be your belief system. Tell me a little bit about your belief system. How does this make you feel? How are you uncomfortable with this? The other, um, the other tip I would give is to remind your client. And I do this with my own clients. I'm not the only attorney out there. We have to match as people and you have to feel comfortable with me because this is an important part of your life. This is your family. It, I don't just see you as a retainer. Um, and there are others out there with different styles and different abilities and different focus and encourage them um, to match with someone that they feel comfortable. Give them that option. Um, that, that's what I would recommend. I, I do it myself and I find that it really uh, goes a long ways towards easing tensions and creating a safe space for that individual to be him or herself. Thank you. And I do, again, wonderful pearls of wisdom there. But I think, um, especially as psychologists, as mental health professionals, we have been trained to be more of a blank screen and not have self-disclosure. But when working with ethnic others, I think humanizing yourself, as you said, being a little bit more open to not have that uh, distance can be very helpful. And the other thing about ethnic match, I don't think that it's always a good idea. Just as I said in my introduction, sometimes similarities can be harmful and sometimes differences can be very beneficial. So also depending on the client's ethnic identity and comfort, there may be many different combinations that are better for the client. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I will match with somebody who's of my ethnic background. They may be more um, uh, unconscious issues that can come up. So I'd like to acknowledge that that's a, um, it's a benefit for some, but not for all to have uh, an ethnic match. So now I'd like to turn to Judge Puente Porras about, um, you know, you had talked about how judges need to be educated and they do have to have a wall. They can't be as self-disclosing as us. So um, Judge, would you please um, help us understand how attorneys can be helpful in this process of cultural sensitivity I agree with everyone who said competence is not the goal, it's humility that we could be working towards. Thank you. Um, and I echo the sentiments of Ms. Patel Griol. It's incredibly um, humbling to be amongst my peers here today and for everybody that's presenting and those attending. Really, that's the importance of it because we all have a message, but if we can't get it out there because people aren't interested, then it really, it's a loss to the entire community. So please uh, keep in mind that this is, it's an ever evolving discussion, right? Nothing is, is, is stoic, nothing is standard. 
So as we journey through this session today and next year and the years to come, we'll be learning something new. The practice of law is just that. That's not frozen in time. Every day, new cases come down. Every day, new situations arise that require us to be sensitive and cognizant of the new interpretation of laws. That being said, as practitioners, whether you're the attorney or the mental health professional, right, we are simply absolutely without a doubt are beholden to the canons. And so we can't, it's not appropriate for the bench officer to personalize the situation, but it would be impractical for you to believe that I don't do my own biases check every time I'm looking at a case, right? So one of the things that is really important for you as practitioners is give us a tip, give us some kind of information the perception that this is just another divorce case, or this is just another matter, the standard run of the mill, parties fight, fighting for the child or fighting over the, I don't know, the property. There's so much more to it, right? So while we don't expect you to give us all of the nitty gritty, I, I think, you know, I, I shared when we were preparing for this course um, about a friend who the they adopted a child from, from Asia and they are Anglo. And up until this child was like 14 or 15, she never disclosed to them that the reason she didn't want both of them to take her to school was because she didn't want to have to justify how she, an Asian young lady, was living with two Anglo parents. Because she felt that when one parent dropped her off, the kids would assume that the other parent was Asian, right? So she was othering herself. And while it's important for the mental health practitioner to know something that you've got to let the bench officer know, right? By the way, there's this thing that we've just learned about. We want to be sensitive to it. One of the things that I tell parents when they're in before me, and I, again, as a family law practitioner, right? You, I used to tell my clients, look, I have to protect you from the other side, but a lot of the time I have to protect you from yourself because you haven't, right? You haven't yet realize that some of the things that you're saying are not good. I know you're reacting. I know it hurts because nobody planned that wedding with the divorce in mind on July 28th, 2023. Nobody had that baby shower with the intention that in three years, we're going to be fighting tooth and nail about where the little three-year-old is going to be, right? So nobody plans for failure and this isn't your failure. So that's one of the things that we as bench officers need to be cognizant of to remember, yes, this is another case on the docket, but we have, this is this family's world. And if there's some mention in the pleadings about, you know, the child has had some identi identity crises because of their foreign adoption, or the child has through the parents, you know, both parents might be saying the same thing, but they refuse to agree on the other one being right. Right. So these are things that you as practitioners, both from the mental health and the legal aspect, please educate us about those things because we can't, we don't have the privilege of having that deep dive with them that you do when you have your consultation, whether it be for treatment or for representation. And so one thing that I do, because I'm very literal and I'm very visual when I read words, I'm reading a book, the newspaper, you name it. I'm like picturing it. It's a movie going on in my head. So one of the things that I do for myself so that I can be competent and address each and one, each and every one of your cases from a rational perspective, not a reactionary perspective. And so this is the thing that I do so that I can stay confident and and humble and empathetic and honor that which I have sworn to do is I prepare my cases a month in advance because when I read those pleadings and I see, you know, parent A is alleging that parent B did this, it it affects me, right? I was a kid. I, I'm an immigrant. I came from a foreign country. I know what it's like to try and fit in to the culture, right? And if I have a parent that now suddenly to... Dr. Bortel's uh, slide, I had a parent that was a IRS agent and the father was a um, maintenance worker, right? And in their divorce paperwork, 
the allegation for why the child, the teenage son, should not be in his custody was because she was educated and he was not. Right. So these are things. So when I read that, thankfully, I did it a month in advance because I let it sift through me. Because one of the things that I now recognize, and, and I think instinctively, you know it as a kid, is that the parents' value to you is immeasurable, right? Like I, my dad would help me with my algebra math, but I didn't know when I was in high school, I didn't appreciate it. He didn't go to school. He taught himself. So a degree did not define his ability to give me support, right? So these are the things that I think you need to please give us a little bit more tips about or me more sensitive. And whatever the case may be, I think we owe it to you as practitioners and in the community, we as the bench officers have to and continue to grow, not just by these seminars, but the continuous development of the law as it gets evolved by cases that the Court of Appeal reminds us, you got it wrong. This is the way you needed to have done it or Look at this perspective. Maybe this was something that you missed. So we're getting it from all sides. So please, we'd like to get it from you all so that we don't get it from the Court of Appeal. Right, Judge Goodman? So, thank yeah, thank you for that. I uh, There again, many pearls that I was uh, uh, dwelling on is that one of the things that often people say, well, my client will educate me to their culture. I think it's really important that we don't rely on our clients because they may not see themselves in an objective way and may not know they're in this stage of ethnic identity development or their, you know, whatever the, um, their experiences are in their context. And it's really important that we educate ourselves of the clients and <clears throat> and check in with them. Of course, it's not, you know, you read a book about everyone from Nigeria and apply it to <laughs> your client, but you say, well, maybe I've, you know, read about this and I, can you tell me more about your experience versus what I think I might know? So these are <clears throat> important things of um, educating ourselves. I'd like to come back to, oh, go ahead. Can I just add, I think, you know, we talk to each other, judges talk to each other, right? We hear something new or something novel. We're, you have, we have our own peer group, right? And like, hey, you know this, I heard this today or we're sharing information all the time. I suspect you're doing the same thing. Obviously not in, no, in any way, shape or form are you breaching confidentiality, but when you learn something new as, as what you're saying, it really is important to share it with your peers, right? Because it, then it might open the door for their newfound knowledge about that issue. So I think the collaborativeness of it without reaching confidentiality, it certainly cuts both ways, attorneys, mental health providers, and I know we do it on the bench, specifically when we're talking about um, issues where there is educational aspects that are affecting the family. So all of these new situations that arise, like I know as soon as I hear something new about the neurodiversity aspect, right? We, we need to address that issue. And I think one of the things that was really impressed upon me when I'm talking to my peers, it's like, I can't assume that they knew about it or they heard about it because they're not reading the same things I am and I'm not reading the same things they are. So we need to be collaborative with those pearls of wisdom that we learn or pick up along the way in our daily jobs. Right, I think uh, building a community and as we are doing with these programs also, so that we can learn from each other's experiences. Wonderful. So, Judge Goodman. I just want to jump in and just add something that, you know, I learned a long time ago. Clients assume we know things that we don't know, or the parties. I still am transitioning. They're not my clients anymore. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they, they, make assumptions and we don't know that. And if we don't ask the right questions, we don't get the right information. And, you know, as a mediator, I learned that like there's certain um, Jehovah's Witnesses have a certain holiday they celebrate that I didn't know about. And, you know, if I didn't ask the parties, it was a mediation, I said, you know, are there specific events that are, are holidays that are important to you? And then they rattled off a bunch of holidays that, you know, are not traditional things that I'm not Anglo-American holidays. 
And so I think it's important. And as a judge, I do the same thing when I'm, you know, helping parties do holiday schedules. What are the holidays that are important to you? What do you celebrate? And they, you know, may bring up things that aren't on the traditional judicial council list. And so, and they don't know that we don't know that. And they don't know that we wouldn't consider it. So if you don't ask the right questions, they don't know what to tell you. So I think part of it is asking questions in a way um, to gather information that we might not otherwise be getting. Yeah, thank you. I, um, I also wanted to now turn to you to help us understand trauma as it's relating to grief and your knowledge of depth psychology and your experiences with your clients and so forth. So, yeah, thank you. And by the way, I'm glad to be back here with all my friends. It's just really nice. Um, I've missed you all. So I want to talk about different kinds of grief because I think they play out differently in a courtroom. Um, you know, one is anticipatory grief, and that may be the party who's planning to get the divorce, and they're already going through the grieving process while they're thinking about getting a divorce. So by the time they tell their spouse, I want a divorce, they're much further along in that grief process than the person who's just been blindsided. And what do you mean you want a divorce? And so I think um, that's something we need to recognize, especially as a practitioner. And as a, when I was doing mediations, I noticed it a lot. And I used to say to the person who'd been planning the divorce for a year or two, or I had a client many years ago who, knowing she needed some job skills before getting divorced. She slept on a, the couch in the living room for four years while getting her BA because she didn't want to leave the marriage without job skills because she didn't trust her spouse to pay support. So by the time she was getting divorced, you know, she was ready. She had grieved that marriage. And then the spouse is blindsided. And, you know, I would frequently say as a mediator, you need to give the other person time to catch up emotionally. You're ready to move forward. You're ready to divide the assets. You're ready to talk about custody. And they're just still spinning. Of, what do you mean you're leaving me? And my whole life is falling apart. So there's that anticipatory grief that I think you need to help clients with. When you have the client that is, um, been planning this for a while, you need to tell them to be patient and give the other person a chance to catch up. And when you have the person who's just been blindsided, you need to say to them, you know, I understand they're pushing hard. They've had more time to deal with this and you're gonna need to process this a little quicker than you might otherwise because of where they're at in the process. So that's one. Um, the other is, the other two I wanna kind of talk about together, which are complicated grief and chronic grief. And somebody in, the chat or the questions posted about high conflict families and you know are we labeling them as, with some pathology and I think a lot of what we see in what we call high conflict families um, in Australia I learned they call them legacy parties um, and I kind of like that they're just they're the you know people who've been in the system court system for a long time but you know they're stuck in their grief somewhere along the line of whatever traumas they've had they got stuck and part of, you know, I see my job is trying to help them as I best I can as a bench officer move through that complicated or chronic grief to be able to come out the other side and not be needed to be in court every three months. Um, and that's really hard. And, you know, sometimes I feel like maybe I can help and other times I can't. Um, some of the times where I've seen chronic or complicated grief come out is where someone um, lost a child or had a miscarriage or a premature death. And so that new child, that child that's born after the child that died or the remaining children after I, a child died of cancer and the, the remaining children, those parents can't let go of them. Um, in one case that I had many years ago, <clears throat> the child wasn't potty trained at four years old. And part of what I realized why the child wasn't potty trained is if the child got potty trained, it meant the child went to preschool. And the child couldn't go to preschool as long as they were still in diapers. And that parent, because of some prior losses and pregnancy loss related losses, couldn't tolerate the child being out of her care. And so then the child being with the other parent was also the same loss as the child going to preschool. I can't have this child away from me for a minute because I might lose this child. And those are the kind of clients that you know, I would like to see in therapy as a lawyer or a mediator, I recommended they go to therapy. Sometimes as a lawyer, I've told clients I wouldn't represent them if they didn't go to therapy. Um, 
to work through that grief that, you know, what's getting in the way. I mean, I've recently had a number of cases of parties fighting over 16 and 17 year old children. And the children have a pretty strong opinion of what they want at that point in life. But what's behind that, I realized, was that chronic grief. They lost, they had a loss of a child, and that's running the show. And, you know, part of it is being able to see that as a lawyer, being able to see where your client gets stuck in that cycle. And it's not just, I want my kid because I need my kid, but I can't tolerate not being with my kid because that's such a loss and I might lose this other kid too. And so helping clients work through that, I think is really important. Um, another grief form of grief that comes up in court, and I feel like this is where judges can play a role is disenfranchised grief. And disenfranchised grief is where others aren't validating your losses. Um, that may be having a neurodiverse child, that may be having a child in prison, that may be all the kinds of, you know, death, we all grieve. Everyone says, God, I'm sorry for your loss, you know, sends condolences when someone dies. But when you have other kinds of non-traditional losses, those don't get recognized. And also sometimes the loss of a marriage or the loss of your children with you full time doesn't get recognized. And the part of that is all disenfranchised grief. And what I found as a judge is if I can, I may not agree with their decisions. I may not agree with their choices. I may not agree with the acts they've done in trying to get what they want that's led them to come to court, but I can acknowledge their grief and validate their feelings of the loss of their marriage, the loss of having their children in their house full time. And I've, I've found that, you know, people need those losses validated. And when you validate those losses, sometimes they can then kind of let go of some of their defenses and hear the rest of what you have to say. Um, because yeah, go ahead, Maria. I, I just want to add to that because that really plays a pivotal role in how the outcome in the hearing will uh, evolve, right? Like I've had folks that are really polarized and they're both grieving the loss of the relationship and now they both want to have the child in their care. And I think one of the ways that an attorney can help is by saying something to the equivalent of, okay, so what is your, what is your projected outcome? What is your wish list? Because I have many attorneys that put, oh, and parent A wants this and parent B, you know, parent A won't let parent B see the child and we want this schedule. And then I'm looking at the schedule and I'm like, okay. But then I look at the income and expense declaration. And just by looking at the type of work that the parent B has, it just instinctively, I'm like, well, wait a minute. This seems like the, you know, like a refinery job, right? They're probably working one of the three shifts. So let's find out what shift they're working on. And then inevitably I'll ask the question. Okay, so parent B, what shift are you working? Oh, I'm working the graveyard shift. Okay, well, let's step back a little bit. And so you go in at what time? Oh, I go in at midnight. You get in out at what time? Oh, I get out at nine or eight or whatever time. Okay, so when you come home, this child is three. Who's going to care for the child? Oh, I'll take care of the child. Okay, but when are you going to sleep? Oh, I can sleep on two hours, right? It's an unrealistic expectation. So please, please, when you have folks that are still struggling to figure out how to share, because sharing is caring, right? I think it's really important to put practicality to the wish list and to the making up for that lost time, right? Because, well, I used to come home and I used to go to bed with the baby and you know, cuddle with them, then we get up at 10 a.m. Okay, well, we can do that, except that you had somebody else there that was helping in the event the baby was up and you needed to sleep, right? So those are things that I think really would be helpful to help not eviscerate the pain or to numb it, but to be realistic on how to work through not just the pain, but the new existence or coexistence in the two separate households. Right. And then let me just mention the last kind of grief I want to talk about is traumatic grief. And, you know, Linda, Dr. Bartell talked a little bit about that of people who've experienced a traumatic loss and, you know, someone who's experienced, for instance, really horrific domestic violence or even not so horrific, but to them, it was pretty horrific. Coming into court and having to see the person who traumatized you is re-traumatizing. And so know that, that, you know, they may shut down, they may um, not be able to talk or not be able to remember things because they're having to sit there in the room with the person that traumatized them. 
Um, one of the things I've found that's been helpful post COVID is um, being able to have remote hearings. Um, it's helpful sometimes for the parties not to be in the same room physically. I found that as a mediator, you know, when COVID hit and I started doing mediations online, um, I, I found that people were more open and more open to talking about things because they weren't physically in the same room as the other person. And so sometimes being one of the benefits I know as a judicial officer, I'm finding there's a number of challenges with remote hearings, but one of the benefits sometimes is you have someone who's um, not as uh, dysregulated, that they're calmer because they're in their own space being able to testify versus sitting in a courtroom um, near someone that has hurt them. And so you get, I think, um, a less stressed, a less stressed person sharing their story, you're going to get more of the story than when they're really dysregulated and agitated and they can't remember what they want to say. And so that is one of the benefits of being able to do things online. Um, so, you know, traumatic grief is another thing that, you know, plays out in the courtroom. So I think that's, those were the main, I think, types of grief that as lawyers, everyone needs to be aware of and needs to be able to talk to your clients about. And I think as lawyers, if you can validate your clients' losses also, that may help them before they come into the courtroom. Right, thank you. I think uh, the issue of dysregulation came up several times from everyone. And, you know, not everyone who's dysregulated is traumatized, but most people who have been traumatized, have gone through trauma, are going to have more dysregulation. And if we don't, we don't address it or see it, um, it can go unrecognized. And I think it's important that we be aware of it. So we're not re-traumatizing people who have already a history of um, traumatic experiences. And Diana, I agree with you about the Zoom, um, you know, online, especially I work with high conflict um, co-parenting couples. And for them, it is often very traumatizing to be back in the same room with the other person and and having the ability to put people on in the waiting room and you know having some clear boundaries of how people will interact and so forth um, will is is really something we've benefited from COVID in that particular way because even though we had Skype and Zoom prior to COVID, we often didn't think of it as the method of working with people and now that's become more acceptable and and it's definitely a good thing to have in our back pocket um so um linda is there uh, yeah Sorry. so i wanted to add um um as um jed goodman was talking about these things that um attorneys can do and one of the things that i i do find myself doing is um in humanizing the experience trying to get get beyond getting further layers of what's actually going on with my client from an emotional standpoint, traumatic standpoint, and, 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 and a holistic standpoint. One of the things that I do is I encourage my clients um, to go to counseling, um, to speak to their you know, church advisors, ministers, a trusted person, if they're not open to therapy, um, but to just find someone where they can actually discuss their emotions, their fears, their beliefs, um, and, and then maybe even dictate notes and share them with me. And the reason I do that, because we're these, the fields that involve, um, family dynamics, whether it's divorce or special education or dependency court, delinquency court, where families are involved. And, um, for attorneys, I know for myself, it's a tremendous amount of work. You're doing the legal work and you're filing the documents and you're making, you know, all of the arguments that you, you need to. But in addition to that, you know, we need to be um, culturally sensitive and we need to be uh, sensitive to the individual and what they may be dealing with. One of the things that I, I, I tend to put it back on my client and say, you know, there are all of these support systems in place for you. And I really, not just in terms of you should, but I really need you to do this. You think you can um, start thinking about these things in this way and maybe, you know, dictate some notes um, and send them to me. Um, that's very, I found that to be very helpful as an attorney. 
Thank you. I think the stigma of mental health services sometimes keeps people from reaching for that help, but the encouragement from a legitimate source like the attorney or the doctor often really steers them to finding support and help in a way that um, they may not seek out on, uh, on their own. I think we do have to be collaborative in our efforts to get people um, to do the right services because, you know, they may not always know that that's, that's a possibility and opportunity that or they that's that's important. That's what I found that the clients that came to me repeatedly or referred and they were saying, oh, well, she really understands or she's going to try to get to know you. Um, and so I, I found that those individuals find it comforting when you tell them, here's how you can also help me help you from just a non-legal perspective. So I can provide the background to the judges in chamber um, on those issues that they might want to kind of hold in the back of their mind. True. Um, there's a, there's a book written about trauma uh, called The Body Keeps the Score, and it's a really good, um, it's kind of dense. The book has a lot of different, very good information, but, um, but it is a good way for us to understand that the traumatic experiences reside in our bodies and that the dysregulation that comes about is a consequence of that. And um, the, you know, divorce is a traumatic experience. Not everyone who's gone through divorce or a traumatic experience will have post-traumatic stress or racial stress or any of those things, but more likely that when you have a lot of different factors adding up, that the uh, there's more, um, expression of that trauma and the person who's experiencing it may not identify that as trauma they just know that they just get dysregulated they can't keep a coherent picture yes judge of course so we're talking about dysregulation and i just want our court culture right we have to be sensitive to people not um being comfortable coming to court so they may have been very comfortable in your office and telling you the story and then they get to court and suddenly they implode, right? So we have to be sensitive as well. Just because a person is filing a lawsuit, when they come before us, we cannot assume that they're emotionally capable of going through the process because that might be their first and only ever experience. They might be in court all the time, but we we have to be sensitive to that. So as practitioners in whatever realm you're in, right? Recognize that their comfort level with you may shift and change when they go to court. So, um, you know, the biggest, I mean, I had a client, he was great. We were talking in the office, read through all the paperwork, all the good stuff. And we get to court and, you know, this guy was like six, three, he used to be a model, blonde, blue eyed, just a, a very, very put together guy. We get to court and he turned into a shriveled little 10 year old, just crying because he just couldn't believe that his marriage had imploded. Right. And I, and I couldn't, you know, we had many, many conversations, but I didn't take the time to take the next step to have him, you know, go to the court. Sometimes you have to do that, right? Because we're used to it. Although, you know, I was nervous, right? Because I thought, okay, this is, this is a big case, right? But I didn't step back to think about how his impression or once he was on that ground, what it was going to do to his psyche. So just food for thought. Yeah, and in, in it relates to, you know, we've talked about implicit biases and so forth they tend to show up when there's more stress and less time available to us. The same thing with trauma. If we can give people a little bit more time and reduce the stress in the moment by empathizing, by being there for them, we can help the process. So our cognitive structures are just you know, meant to react in these panic situations. And if we can give it a time to come down from the flooding 
of emotions, then we can make better decisions. And we, I think we know that. Yes, uh, Dr. Bortel is gonna have some closing remarks on this subject. You're muted. You're I was just going to have some remarks to you, but perhaps I can also have some closing remarks. I was just, I just wanted to remind everybody that it, we always used to grow up thinking it's flight or fight. Like those are the two choices, but it's actually fight, flight, or freeze. Um, and so if you have a client who's immobilized, who can't do anything, like my, like my client who saw that attorney paper with the scary numbers. She would get it. And there was one time she got an envelope from her attorney and then she came to see me and she said, you have to open it. I can't like even touching it activated her that she was so aroused. And in that, when you're, when you're hyper aroused like that, the first thing that physiologically happens is you can't hear. You can't hear. So, and if anybody has any kids or has been around kids and you see a toddler losing their cookies, you know that you can say, calm down and it doesn't matter at all because they can't hear you. Um, and so if you have a severely traumatized client, it might mean that you just carefully put a hand on their back, but you ask first because touch could be a thing, but just so they, you know, even though they know you're right next to them, they might need to really feel you, um, you know? So there's different ways that if you know that you have a client who's really ADHD, you might say, can you put like a, a squishy ball or something in your pocket? And maybe you can sit there cause you're not gonna chew gum in court, but maybe you can sit there and just kind of play with it. And that stimulation can help you focus. So there's lots of small things that we can do. And sometimes that is asking your clients, you know, what helps you in these situations? How can I help you so that everybody can have the best outcome that they need? And, you know, again, with the racial stuff that there's just so many layers of things that we need to be aware of all the time um, <clears throat> and never be afraid to ask and never be afraid to put yourself out there because this is a journey for all of us. We are all learning. I hope to be learning before I take my last breath on this earth um, and especially about some of these issues. So as always, it is it is just a, a pleasure and it is I, I, I love being on these panels because I love learning from my colleagues and I love hearing what we all collaborate and come up with together. So thank you. Well, I wanna thank our wonderful panel for um, helping us open our minds and hearts, as we said, um, to issues that often we don't talk about or have discomfort talking about. And um, this is a wonderful place for us to, to be able to bring our thoughts and experiences and I really appreciate the personal examples and stories that everyone has shared today. Thank you. Hi, uh, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't, I have one last comment, so go ahead. No, for you. I asked Carmen to post the case for you guys. It is case of, this was decided in 2014 and it just, tells you how we changed. This is a case of JQ and TB. Uh, this was in Orange County. And this is, I read it for you from quotation of the appellate court. Con contrary to counsel's closing argument, the trial court opined there were cultural issues at play. And there is a language problem because the language's nuisance are lost in translation. The court has stated that, for example, JQ wanted to control the family's finances. JQ is a wife. And Japanese culture, it is common for the wife to control the money. The court said if Chinese culture, the parties, they were Chinese. If Chinese culture is consistent with Japanese culture, the court would not be surprised if JQ, wife, made such a request. 
The court has stated that although American culture is changing, many American men are unwilling to cede control of the family's finances, especially to non-English non -English speaker. This was not 100 years ago, this was eight years ago. And the court denied request for domestic violence because it says it was situational, it was not recurrent. I just probably. So thank you very much for the really informative and eye-opener argument that we had. This was uh, as usual, whatever we expected. Thanks to all speakers. I just, uh, we will have a, a few minutes of break before our lunch with judicial officers starts, but Bill uh, Spiller has few comments to make. So with thanks to everybody, Bill, please have the podium. Thank you, Abbas. Uh, I always like it that, that Abbas always says that I have comments, whether I actually have comments or not. Uh, but I do have one comment that I'd like to make. Uh, I did not know uh, Attorney Graywall uh, before this presentation, but but I think that the presentation and the panelists were so good that we should keep this panel together. And I'd ask Abbas to obligate all of them <laughs> to commit to next year as well. Uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, it, it's amazing the things you learn about people that you never think about. Uh, and so one of the benefits of the seminar is our bench officers and our therapists uh, and, and the attorneys always give us a little insight into their personal lives that we never knew anything about. Uh, and I, I think it, it, it gives us all a different take on who they are. But if you're not listening, don't be surprised when you go into court and you hear something that you didn't think that these people didn't know and they have known for many years. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, hope to see you again on a panel next year. And, and just to for a, uh, just to complete the story, uh, Aradi just sent a note that Family Violence Appellate Project was the attorney that in that case, which I mentioned, the Chinese American experience, and uh, our friends in FEPAP just were the one that who brought that case and obtained a uh, a good result. And on that note, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Gitu. Thank you, Linda, judges, Bill, and uh, Miss Grable. And see you all at twelve o'clock. Don't go away. Thank you.
Okay, now the famous lunch with your judicial officer. Okay. Normally, at this point, we have a, a full table of uh, food from all over around the world. That instead of, uh, I, I hope that Carmen can uh, yeah, <laughs> some of these pictures. I, yeah, there, there we go. <laughs> I promise you next year we're going to have this is a actually this is for breakfast and normally we started breakfast with French American Bar Association uh, courtesy of Elise Sayadian she uh, provided us with all the goodies from a bakery in a Paris bakery in LA and for lunch we had Persian food Hopefully next year we will repeat that. On this light mode, lighter mode, good afternoon to all judicial officers honored us to be here present. Uh, this panel is courtesy of Commissioner Cohen and, and, and Judge Roberts, which they put it together and we honor all our judicial officers that honored us to present today. Uh, Alan Stein is the coordinator, and Alan, go ahead and please uh, introduce uh, the panelists, and let's just start. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to introduce this panel and to welcome all of our judicial officers. And what continues to stand out to me every year is the richness and range of backgrounds and experience of our family law bench just looking at the eight bench officers on today's panel, and if you haven't taken a look at their bios, I encourage you to do so. In addition to their impressive academic credentials, judicial clerkships, some have advanced degrees in areas outside of law. There were prosecutors, public defenders, in-house counsel, big firm attorneys, small firm practitioners. Some of them have a family law background, Others come from criminal practice, practice patent law, commercial, business, employment, immigration. And they were not just practicing law and going to law school and clerking. They were also tremendously engaged in the community in which they live. We have judicial officers on this panel who've worked in state and local government. They served on bar committees. They founded and assumed leadership positions in bar associations, such as the National LGBTQ Bar Association, the Filipino Bar Association. They've contributed to professional treatises, created scholarships, taught students, founded and directed law school clinics, and served on boards of nonprofits, to name a few of their accomplishments and interests. They've concerned themselves in pro bono world with access to justice issues, diversity in the profession. They've supported medical missions to Central America, worked on behalf of homeless and disabled clients and a range of other areas. Now, what do we ask of our judicial officers? Many of the panelists are new to the bench. They're still learning family law and they're learning a new job. They're all handling sizable dockets filled with my colleagues, the zealous advocates and self-represented litigants. Those litigants are also often going through major life transitions and maybe a little more emotionally volatile than your average party. The matters they decide every day impact the most intimate and important aspects of litigants' lives, access to their children, their financial future, their personal safety. And on top of all that they do during the week, we ask them to show up on a Saturday for us, and they do. So it is with tremendous thanks and appreciation to our judicial officers that I introduce this panel, and with special thanks to Commissioner Cohen and Judge Roberts for the time, energy, and enthusiasm with which they jumped in to organize this panel. I turn the program over to you, Commissioner Cohen. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for all of your support and help to putting our panel together and for all that you do as well. Uh, thank to Judge Roberts and all of my colleagues for your time here today and most thank you to Abbas for your commitment 
to this program. It is unfortunate that we're not in person. I would love to have a plate of those falafels in front of me right now. I'm gonna imagine it though. But I just wanna thank everybody for being here today, for having the opportunity for us to introduce some of our newer bench officers. But as you can hear, they come from all areas and are very impassioned about this issue here today. Um, I myself am a commissioner. I've been on the bench for approaching five years now. I've been in family law the entire time. And for the majority of the time, I've been in a restraining order department. I've asked to stay in that assignment. I greatly enjoy that assignment. I'm at mosque in department 94. And for those that don't know, we handle all types of restraining orders. So not just domestic violence, I handle civil harassment, gun violence, elder abuse, school violence and workplace violence. So I do have an um, opportunity to come across a wide range of persons in my department from all areas of Los Angeles. And I enjoy it very much. And I am always learning as one of the prior panelists said, every day I learn something new about those that are in our community and I wanna to continue to learn. So that's why I'm here today. I will pass this over to my colleague, Judge Gary Roberts. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, I strongly echo everything that Commissioner Cohen just said, although I won't repeat all of it. It's, it's wonderful to be part of this uh, group. It's wonderful to be part of this effort. And I will single out uh, Abbas for his uh, amazing leadership in this area over many years. Commissioner Cohen and I were talking and not that we wanted to say no to this, we absolutely wanted to say yes, but we couldn't say no to, to Abbas because of the example that he sets, which is really remarkable. Uh, I was like, likewise struck this morning, uh, listening to the other panels. I wasn't surprised at all, but I was struck by what a privilege it is uh, to be part of this community. I mean, the, the heart, the, the knowledge, the passion that I've heard expressed on so many different topics this morning, all of course around our commitment to helping families uh, is really remarkable. And like Commissioner Cohen, I've been at this for about five years. I have a hybrid assignment in Van Nuys, as many of you know. Uh, I've been doing it for five years and in large part because of the community that I was talking about and that Commissioner Cohen spoke about so eloquently a moment ago. I'm very pleased to, to continue doing this work. What we wanna do on the panel is we want to have a conversation, uh, of course, to make sure that moves along. We have some questions to prompt us. Uh, but because some of the panel members may not be known to everybody, uh, we wanted to give each of the panel members a few minutes to kind of try to give a little bit of insight into themselves, into him or herself, uh, as, uh, as judicial officers and perhaps as people. Um, and so we're going to open up by giving each one of our panel members an opportunity to, um, to speak for a few minutes and just kind of uh, make an introduction. So I did not alert the panelists on this point, but it seems to me the first way to do it is to do it in alphabetical order. So we'll start with Judge Bloom if you're up for it. I can handle an introduction. <laughs> Good morning, Gary. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. This is a really important topic and I'm uh, very happy to participate. I'm one of the newer members of the bench. I was appointed by Governor Newsom uh, approximately six months ago. And uh, I think it's fair to say I had a fairly circuitous and weird pathway uh, uh, to the, the bench. I did practice law for about 27 years in a small practice. It was a solo practice for most of that time. Uh, uh, following that, I uh, did a stint in the nonprofit world for two or three years. Um, and during which, uh, uh, the, uh, during the time that I practiced law and uh, was in the nonprofit world, I was also a council member and the mayor of uh, the city of Santa Monica. Uh, I uh, 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 in uh, 2012 was elected to the state assembly and uh, I'm very uh, uh, proud to have been a member of that body for a, a decade before being appointed. In virtually all of these pursuits, the idea of uh, inclusivity and diversity and uh, all the things that uh, uh, this 
panel and, and this program are focused on has been a focus for me. Uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that from the time I started practicing law um, to now, there's been a huge amount of uh, uh, transition and increased awareness about just how important uh, these issues are in one of the most diverse regions, uh, LA County and state, the state of California, where we uh, have uh, individuals who live uh, here who come from every background uh, and uh, 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 share so many qualities, but also differ in so many ways. And that's what makes this a beautiful place. So, thank you, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Judge Goodman, you're up next. Okay, well, most of you heard Abbas's and Bill Spiller's introduction earlier. Um, I was practicing, there was a practicing family law lawyer for over 30 years before being appointed by Governor Newsom in December. Um, never thought this would be what I'd be doing this late in my career, but I'm really honored to be doing it and uh, very excited to be doing it. Um, I, the last probably 15, 20 years of my career, I was doing mediations. And I think that really helped prep me for this position because one of the things I was told when I became a judge is you're not the advocate for the parties anymore. You need to let go of that uh, warrior advocacy uh, role that lawyers play. And I had let go of that a number of years ago. So I was already um, in a neutral position as a mediator. And I think that helped a lot that, um, you know, my goal as a judge is to hear the parties out, um, ask questions when the parties are represented, letting the lawyers do it, but ask questions. And, you know, because of my PhD in psychology, I really like try to figure out what's behind what the parties are saying, what's really going on. Um, as we talked about earlier, what are the traumas they've experienced and then validating their experiences. And I found that's really helped. Um, I'm sitting in Lancaster and family law. So I'm Thrilled to be doing family law, which is what my background is in, um, aside from adoptions and assisted reproduction. And I love Lancaster and I don't mind the drive at all. I actually like it. Um, it's very peaceful out there and uh, it's a great bench in Lancaster. And so I'm you know, taking all of the skills that I've learned in my many years on this planet, as well as my many years as a lawyer and a mediator and now applying them as a judge and, you know, um, it's been very rewarding and I'm very humbled to be able to do this work now. So thank you. I'm curious. It sounds like it's been a seamless transition. Has there been anything that's been surprising to you about it or has it been pretty much what you expected? Well, what I heard from those judges who didn't practice family law was many long hours. So I was really sort of panic stricken going in. Um, my family law background is paying off, but my lack of litigation um, is a reminder that I still have a lot to learn that, you know, I need refreshers and I'm regularly reading new things and catching up on things, but, you know, the litigation process is very different than mediation as a mediator. I help parties make a decision. And now as the judge, I have to make the decision. That was a big transition. Yeah. Um, but all the, the family law background is really paying off now. It's a matter of learning how to be a judge and, you know, I'm, reading and studying everything I can, watching my colleagues, learning from them. Um, I do want to say that this group of judges on the family law, law bench throughout the county are just amazing. And everybody has been so welcoming, so supportive of each other, um, you know, willing to teach me whatever I don't know, willing to answer the phone whenever I have a crisis of, I'm not sure what to do next um, and giving me guidance more, not so much on the legal, the family law aspects, but how to be a judge aspect. So. That's been, that's been the big transition. Thank you. Well, we are blessed to have you and blessed to have Judge Malone. Uh, Judge Kim, you're up next. All right, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Gia Kim. I've been on the bench for about a year now. I'm in the Van Nuys courthouse in a home court there. Uh, immediately before being appointed, uh, and for 15 years before that, I was a deputy federal public defender where I mostly ha handled appeals. So unlike Judge Goodman, I did. it was not a seamless transition. It was going from appeals to trial level, criminal, federal to 
state family law practice. So it has been a big transition. I do think there were certainly in my prior position issues of cultural competency that came up. Most of you know, my clients by, by definition indigent, many of them were non-citizens, uh, non-English speaking, and even more broadly, I would say many of them were not only the product of family conflict, but also the cause in some sense, you know, in some scenarios of family conflict. Uh, so aside from the big substantive transition to family law, I think one of the biggest differences that I've been struck with is uh, the emphasis on settlement and mediation processes, the value placed on that, the value placed on not just resolving the the single dispute in front of you, but also getting the parties hopefully to some point where, you know, they're better able to manage their conflicts going forward. And then the support provided to bench officers in that regard, uh, not only family court services and their mediation, but also, you know, minors council, the local bar association and, you know, volunteering to help settle cases and so forth. So that has really been um, a big, you know, eye-opening and welcome, you know, difference, I think, from my prior practice. Uh, about me, I am not from California. I was born, my parents emigrated from South Korea in the late 60s, early 70s, and settled in Philadelphia. Uh, and I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And, you know, there is not, unlike in LA or New York, a very big Korean community uh, in Philadelphia, at least at that time. So there was some, I think, sense of dislocation for my parents uh, living there. And they stayed there because, you know, the schools there were good. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, coming to California in my 20s, I think was, you know, was a huge change from being one of maybe 10 non-white students in my high school class, three of whom had the last name Kim, which confused everyone else in the school. Um, so I, you know, I'm very happy to be in LA and in the Van Nuys courthouse and you know, thrilled to have such supportive colleagues. Thank you very much. I can echo both those things. We're thrilled to have you on the court and in Van Nuys. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, Judge Rojas. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Adrian Rojas. I am currently sitting in the Compton Courthouse uh, in a family law calendar. Uh, prior to my appointment in October of last year, I had a short stint as a family law practitioner with uh, my wife. Um, so I did that for about two years, but the majority of my experience comes as a, a prosecutor with the LA County DA's office where I handled exclusively family law cases or family violence cases, child abuse, domestic violence, uh, familial homicides, um, where I did that for about uh, 15, 14 years in the Compton Courthouse as well. So I, as soon as the Compton Courthouse had an opening for family, I jumped at that opportunity. Um, I was born and raised in that area, specifically in Carson. My parents immigrated from the Philippines in the 70s. So I'm very familiar with that community, and it's just been a great honor to be able to uh, go back there and serve that community in the role as a judge. Um, thank you. Well, thank you for that. Has there been anything surprising or interesting to you about the transition? I think, uh, as a Judge Goodman said earlier, is, is taking the role of a neutral at that point, not being an advocate for one side or the other. Um, that's obviously one of the most difficult transitions I think we have as new judicial officers uh, when we are so used to advocating for one side. Um, but it, it's been a pretty smooth transition other than that. Um, and, you know, I do my best to, to be as neutral as I can. Uh, that's what I'm charged with. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much the one of the biggest challenges that I've had so far was uh, not jumping in when I, I want to. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a natural instinct to jump in, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's a difficult transition that I've, I'm, I'm still learning. Fantastic. Well, we are blessed to have you, Judge Weinberger. 
Good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you, Gary, uh, Judge Roberts. Um, so my name is William Weinberger. Um, I am sitting in Department 22 at Mosque in the home court. I've been there since uh, the beginning of May. I was appointed in June of 2022. I started, took the bench in uh, beginning of August uh, of 2022 in the Chatsworth Courthouse, and then I was transferred uh, a few months ago. Um, so I, in terms of why I became a judge, I, I had always, uh, so my first job after law school was to clerk for a federal judge, the chief judge of the U.S. District Court in, in Cleveland, Ohio, where I'm originally from. And um, it was a very sort of inspiring experience, partly because of the judge I, I clerked for. And, and that got me thinking that I always had this fantasy that I'd, I'd want to be on the bench. I thought I would be good at it. And... Um, and then my partner of 28 years uh, said that when we first met and we're getting to know each other, I had mentioned that to him. So every few years he'd say, so when are you gonna do something about it? And so finally during COVID, I, I uh, bit the bullet and, and, and submitted my application and, and um, it's been everything I had fantasized about and more. Um, I think the surprising thing about being a judge for me um, has is particularly on the family court because I did not practice family um, law is the level of discretion that family court judges have because in the civil practice um, there's not that which is what I practice there's not the, the judges don't have that level of uh, discretion uh, uh, for the most part the other part was just um, how involved. I, as a judge, uh, have an obligation to be, particularly with where there's self-represented litigants, to um, ask questions and make the record. Because again, in, in, in the civil courts, judges don't want to have the reputation of not letting parties try their cases. And here we have an obligation to. So that was, that was surprising. And then just the transition, I don't think I had a, a difficulty transitioning from advocate to judge, except that the, having to decide and determine credibility, that took some getting used to. Um, because in, in, in my practice, I, I would you know, try and see what um, weaknesses there might be in my client's credibility or on the other side, but to actually listen to both sides and then have to decide, uh, it's a skill um, that I had to develop. Um, also, working in family, uh, the level of emotion um, uh, and how, uh, how a significant role it has in a lot of cases um, uh, has, uh, in my impression, is, is much higher than in, in most civil cases and it's something else that as a judge I've had to deal with. Um, I think coming to the bench, I had a civil practice, uh, it was a commercial practice business and, and real estate and employment uh, law mostly. Uh, but I also um, was elected to a commission that rewrote the LA City Charter and I had other public positions, uh, but also working on Capitol Hill in DC. And one of the things I learned that I think has helped me is that when people are talking about issues that are important to them, they won't necessarily express in a way that is the most uh, welcoming way, um, but, I've learned to go beyond be, behind that and say, what are they really concerned about? Um, and I think that's a good skill for, for a judge on the family bench. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of cultural competency, I, I, you know, my parents were immigrants from, from Vienna. They fled the Nazis. They, they fled uh, separately in the late thirties. Um, and, Part of my personal experience of cultural competency is uh, understanding what role their culture from, from Vienna and as immigrants had on my worldview um, and how that might impact other people in terms of how I was acting. Um, but also I'm in a um, biracial relationship. My, my partner is, is black. And so um, uh, it, it's been a matter of uh, on, on both his family and my family, in terms of welcoming each other, which which they've both done, um, that's been um, an experience um, 
personal experience with cultural competency that I think has uh, stood me in good stead. So I'm happy to be on the bench and to be here today. Well, thank you. We're, we're happy to have you on the bench as well. Uh, last and certainly not least, Judge Yang. Good afternoon. I'm Brian Yang, and I sit in Department H of the Pomona Courthouse. Um, I want to quickly thank the LA County Bar Association, specifically the Family Law Section, Abbas, Hajian, William Spiller, the other co-hosts like the Iranian American Lawyers Association, the sponsors, and LACMA staff like Carmen Richardson. Thank you all for organizing today's event. Um, my professional background is in your handout, um, so I won't repeat it. Um, what might be interesting and relevant to uh, today's seminar is my personal background. Um, my family and I fled Burma, now known as Myanmar, in 1988. Uh, just as the military junta was starting a violent crackdown on pro-democracy activists. Um, our country and state uh, welcomed us, and we settled here in Los Angeles, um, specifically the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, it was a bit difficult for us in the beginning. Uh, English was not our first language. My parents worked uh, 12, 14-hour days um, as a cashier and a busboy for the National Dollar Store. Uh, and we lived in, with extended family, I, I think 10 of us total uh, in a three bedroom condominium. So I feel incredibly fortunate uh, to have been given this honor of being a judge and especially blessed, um, really blessed to serve families and children um, in times of great instability, insecurity, and conflict. I was recommended by many to ask for an assignment downtown because it's seen as the center of power and influence, um, but I asked to be assigned to a courthouse in the San Gabriel Valley, um, the very community that welcomed and raised me. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience and the attorneys who practice in the East District are just excellent, some of whom I see are in attendance today. Again, thank you for having me today. Well, it's great to be your colleague. What, what we wanna do, um, we have some questions here that are, as I said, that are intended to be prompts for a conversation. And we'll have one judicial officer lead off the discussion, and then hopefully others will uh, feel uh, moved to jump in. I, I wanna just go all the way back to 8.30 this morning when Judge Kaufman was talking about what an incredibly uh, rich and diverse place Los Angeles is. And again, it's certainly reflected in our panel and in our uh, attendees today. I also was struck by the comment that was made a couple of times about the whole idea of cultural competence being a, a myth or at least an overreach. Um, and I thought that was an interesting notion, the idea that we, we can never really get there. Um, but I think what we all strive to do as practitioners and as judicial officers is to learn how to learn about cultural uh, issues. And so hopefully at least in that limited sense, we can become more uh, culturally competent. We're going to share some experiences personal and otherwise um, that relate to that. So the first question um, is, is really more of a personal one, and that is whether anyone has any examples of assumptions that others have made about you, whether parties or counsel uh, that felt uh, insensitive or misinformed. And Judge Weinberg, I'll let you lead us off on that one. Okay. Um, well, uh, early in my career, um, uh, I started out with a, a, a LA office, a big international firm, and I just moved to LA. And I was not out as a gay man at the firm, uh, and it was um, it was a uh, it was a very homophobic uh, environment. So. I started looking for, for other employment after I'd been there for about a year and a half. And um, I, I did not interview or apply as an openly gay man, yet there was not um, 
there was not employment protections. And so I was concerned about that. So I was um, talking to a firm that was very interested in me and they took me to lunch and I was going back up in the elevator to their firm and they started making homophobic comments to me, um, assuming I wasn't gay. Um, and, um, you know, I, I crossed that, that firm off the list. But it's happened in other situations where it's been benign, but it still shows that people, just the, the, the assumptions we make and they're split second. Um, I had a colleague uh, was, was talking to me and, and said, um, uh, you know, uh, why don't you have your wife, you know, so you suggest I have, uh, have my wife participate in something. And, uh, you know, and I said, um, well, you know, I'm gay. I have a, a partner of 28 years. And he, you know, he's very apologetic. And I said, uh, you know, but it's just, again, it wasn't mean spirited. It was uh, a matter of, you know, us getting to know each other. And that was part of it. But again, it's the initial snap assumptions that we make about each other that I'm always having to, uh, you know, question myself about. So those are two examples, one that was not benign, the other one that was um, ben misinformed, but benign. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? I have I have a, a couple of, I think, relatively benign ones, one of which I find quite uh, humorous, actually. And that is, um, I obviously speak English with a bit of a Southern accent. So that leads to a number of assumptions you might imagine. It's, pre it's frequently assumed um, that I am an expert on guns and have a house full of them. And that comes up in all kinds of different subtle ways. It doesn't really bother me, uh, but it reminds me that people uh, very often hear one fact about you and assume they know all the rest. And so I try to be aware of that tendency in myself. Um, the other one, which I'm not, uh, I'm likewise not sensitive about that, but comes up all the time. And again, it relates a little bit to speaking English with a Southern accent. The language of my home is Spanish. Uh, a big chunk of my family is from Argentina. Uh, it happens to me every single day uh, that that people will make assumptions, uh, cultural assumption, assumptions, assumptions, uh, but particularly language assumptions. I've learned very quickly on the elevator as soon as two people are speaking Spanish to say, well, "Hold on, I think you think you're having a private conversation. You're not, because what tends to happen if I don't jump in and do that quickly." is they say something that makes it so embarrassing for them to, in fact, learn they aren't having a private conversation. So anyone else on that first one? Personal experiences? I, I did have an experience on the bench when uh, I was covering a courtroom in which there was a, a pro tem and there was a, a non-stip to the pro tem and I took the bench to cover wearing my robe. And then the petitioner uh, raised, you know, my name was announced, raised his hand and was like, excuse me, I wanted a judge on my case. So <laughs> that is certainly an assumption that's only happened once. I did not end up hearing that case because it was continued, but um, so that does still happen. Um, yes. All right, anyone else on that first question? Um, so the second question is a little less, uh, a lot less personal. And that is, can you share examples of situations involving the interactions among counsel or among the parties or among the parties and counsel that reflect improper cultural assumptions? How have you handled these situations? I'm sure we have a long list of these. Uh, Judge Rojas, would you like to lead us off on that one? Sure. Uh, I had a case uh, a few months ago where the uh, litigants uh, requested the interpreter, uh, a Cantonese interpreter. Um, the, um, you know, Cantonese is my, my family, my wife speaks Cantonese and my children speak Cantonese. Uh, so I, I know that it is a very loud, uh, cacophonous language, but the attorney on the case um, kept on asking me to direct the witness to answer the question and not be so combative. 
um, because he was speaking loud. Uh, and and I had to, you know, in, in a judicial way, as the most judicious way possible, say he's answering your question. <laughs> he's not being combative. Um, but I think the assumption was that because he was loud and he was, it appeared that he was yelling, that he was being combative and non-responsive. And actually that was part of the argument at the end was, you know, the witness was so combative uh, during his response to my questioning, he couldn't answer the question. And I, I just had to make sure that the record was clear that the answers were being questioned, uh, sorry, the, the questions were being answered accordingly. The words that he was using in answering the questions were non-combative. The tone um, was part of his answer. That's the way he spoke. And that's that's a characteristic of the language that he spoke. Um, but I, I think, you know, not having that understanding and not being aware of, of that that um, that tone, um, it, you know, to me, it was surprising that he wasn't aware of that because Chinese is the second most spoken language in LA. It's 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 we hear it, you know, in, in various communities. Um, but to make that argument to me seemed kind of um, uh, disingenuous, uh, and I just had to make sure that the record was clear that the the uh, questions that the witness was being asked was in fact uh, being answered accordingly. Uh, despite the tone that the attorney perceived it to be. Any other examples of that? That's a great one. I, I, I had a, I have an example of uh, interactions between attorneys who were appearing before me, uh, one of whom was uh, uh, a white male attorney and the other uh, a woman. Um, and the attorney began making disparaging remarks about the attorney that the the woman attorney um and uh which related not just to her being a woman but also uh subtly to her ethnic background in terms of uh what she he said was saying how aggressive she was being and um it didn't help his argument at all um, because it wasn't relevant to the issues in the case. And, um, and um, I, I did not intervene. Uh, she um, pretty much, um, well, I did intervene because she started saying something like that. And I said, okay, I, I just want the attorneys to focus on the issues in the case and no comments about the opposing counsel. Um, and that was the, the extent of it. But she, she was holding her own in terms of responding to it herself without de detracting from her, distracting from her, uh, what she was arguing to the court. Other examples? I can share one. In the restraining order department, right at the start of COVID, I had one of the very first coercive control um, cases that I had filed in my department with a cultural family that was so had um, four children and there was really a, a request by both parents to have the children testify and I had um, two of the parties including one of the parents had um, a wide range of disabilities as well and parents were represented by legal aid organizations and I had asked which I rarely do in a restraining order department but I thought that this family would benefit from a PPA, um, and which is very rare that I order in a restraining order department, but I did get everyone to agree upon that. And I have to say, um, it was one of the most thoughtful and culturally sensitive PPA recommendations that I have ever had. And the parents did adopt it. We still did have some type of restraining order that the uh, one party submitted to, but the recommendations were so um, beneficial towards the family, their cultural, their culture, and their um, disabilities. I thought it was really beneficial. So since the question was, what have we done to kind of help? I do know that we do have some tools in the toolboxes here on the bench. And if counsel are willing to uh, stipulate for them, then we can try to help serve the communities. Thank you. And any more comments on that second issue? All right, I'll, I'll go on to the third, which is somewhat related. And that is, can you share examples of specific situations that have come up in your courtroom 
that may reflect cultural differences? How have you handled those? What might council do to make these situations more comfortable for all involved? Uh, Judge Yang, would you like to take the lead on that? Sure, thanks Judge Roberts. Um, a common argument that I've seen from attorneys and pro se litigants is that the other parent cannot care for a minor child as well because they live in an intergenerational household. Um, I won't speak as to other cultures, but in the Burmese community, and I think in the broader Asian and Pacific Islander community, it's very common for you know, people to live under the same roof, grandparents, parents, uncles, aunts, um, and children. Um, and I stated earlier in my introduction, you know, I myself was raised in an intergenerational household of 10 people uh, in a three bedroom condo. Um, and I generally do not find um, that argument persuasive, um, the argument that living in such a household is detrimental to a minor child. Um, because I think it's frankly culturally insensitive and underlying such an argument is that one parent is richer and therefore the better parent. Uh, I very much disagree with the assumption that a poor parent cannot be a good parent. Um, luckily, we know that comparative income or economic advantage is not a permissible basis for a custody award. Uh, our Supreme Court has held that there is no basis for assuming a correlation between wealth and good parenting or even wealth and happiness. Uh, that quote is from the Merchard case. Um, I think this argument will become less prevalent in light of the current rising cost of housing. Um, the Pew Research Center stated that, you know, the share of the US population in multi-generational homes has more than doubled uh, from 7% in 1971 to 18% in 2021. The better arguments to be made, um, or the arguments that are better than simply the number of residents under the same roof um, are, for example, is there someone at the residence who has a criminal history that poses a threat to the child? Is the residence filthy and inhabitable? Is there access to drugs or firearms? I think those line of arguments uh, are gonna be far more persuasive. All right, thank you. Who else would like to speak to that topic? I will. I This is a was sort of a weird thing that did surprise me. I, um, a couple of weeks ago was flipping a, told the parties we're going to flip a coin. Sorry, dogs just went nuts. Um, we're gonna flip a coin to see who's going first to divide some furniture. Um, it was a very low income family. English was not their first language. And one of the parties didn't know what flipping a coin was. That was not something that they did in their culture. And I had to stop and we explained what heads and tails meant. And it just meant who was going first to pick the furniture. And, you know, it just, it was a good learning experience for me to remind me that just those little idioms that we do aren't universal in all cultures. Anything else on that? Um, I, you know, I'd like to dovetail on what Bryant was saying about multi-generational housing because, um, you know, my, my background uh, in politics is all about housing. But the uh, uh, the notion of intergenerational housing rarely comes up and is rarely seen as a solution. And what I was thinking while Bryant was talking is just just how much prejudice there is, um, and it's typically characterized in an anti-male way um, uh, in the majority populations of the of the state and probably the country where. Um, you know, living with your parents uh, past a certain age is seen as a joke. It's seen as something um, that is clearly less than ideal. Um, and that's uh, uh, something uh, we all ought to be 
much more sensitive to and uh, and be thinking about. Thank you. Um, the, the point was made earlier, and I think it's worth making again about the the role of counsel in this area to make the court aware of particular things that might come up. For example, I learned the hard way as a new judicial officer that certain uh, religious groups, and it, there are actually a number of them, um, a number of different communities are not comfortable taking an oath. They absolutely cannot take an oath. Now, actually the wording, what we call colloquially an oath in California is not technically an oath, but I've had it, I, I had it happen where uh, I asked someone to stand up, raise his right hand, and we had an awkward moment where, where he said, I, I can't, I can't take, I can't swear. And then we had to kind of work our way through that, where if counsel had said, by the way, and now when I see that coming, what I do is I'll, I'll say to the clerk, we have an individual or we have parties in the courtroom who have a, a cultural problem or a cultural prohibition on taking an oath. So I will tell them, will you please rise to be affirmed? Will you change the wording of the, which does not say swear in it anyway, but to say affirm, which is, has been held to be legally operative and just avoid the whole issue. It's one of those things where if you see it coming uh, and if counsel had, have educated you to that issue, you can avoid an awkward moment for someone in the court. Another one I'm embarrassed to say just happened last week. As many of you know, a big part of my life is conducting uh, settlement conferences. Um, so that involves having a group session generally and then breakout sessions. It's an Orthodox Jewish couple. I go into the breakout room uh, and close the door behind me. And the, the, the woman has a very strong reaction and I don't know what she's reacting to. And the lawyer then tells me, oh, she can't be uh, in, the, in the room uh, with a, another male other than her husband with a closed door. I'm like, I, I can, I can, easily accommodate that and I just felt bad that I didn't I, I wasn't aware of that issue beforehand so that we started off what was supposed to be an opportunity to to build a rapport in a way that was that was very awkward and 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 I could tell actually quite upsetting to her so that's a, again that's a long-winded way of saying the more you can do as as advocates to anticipate issues like that to make the court aware to make court staff aware um, and I know the people I'm preaching to the choir here because by definition, you're interested in these issues, but just, I, I guess what I'm saying is feel free to educate the court, certainly in my court. And I think I can speak for my colleagues on anything like that, that we can do to make the experience more comfortable uh, for the, those who participate. That just reminds me of something when I was a lawyer many years ago, I had a divorce case where my client was an Orthodox Jew. The lawyer on the other side was not Jewish. And I was negotiating the exchange times on Friday. And I said, you know, in the winter, we need to make them earlier. And he said, well, what's wrong with your client that he can't drive at night? And I explained that, you know, in Judaism, one doesn't drive on the Sabbath that once the sun goes down. And the lawyer looked at me with complete disbelief, which really surprised me in, this was in Orange County, it really surprised me, um, went back to his client, talked to his client, came back and said, very humbly, what else do I need to know about this family? Wow, that's, that's a great story. Anyone else, any more examples on number three? Um, Not I, I, I have, if, if I can, a, a brief yes, one. And so, when I first took the bench uh, back in August of last year, you know, when I'd come on the bench, I'd say, you know, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I had a, um, uh, in my first week, I had a domestic violence matter. Uh, and I thought it was between two men. And uh, it turns out one of the parties was non-binary or trans. And um, I thought about the impact of just assuming everyone is 
you know, a, a binary gender might have uh, on litigants who are there at a very difficult time in their life in an environment, this was, you know, self, particularly for self-represented parties that is foreign to them and high pressure to come in and be excluded. So I started uh, just as a little change, but I just, I just say good morning, or I say good morning, everyone. Now it's that's sort of to me a small change, but to someone who's coming in, who ladies and gentlemen would exclude, um, it could just put another uh, barrier to them uh, feeling comfortable and being able to represent themselves. Thank you. All right, I think if uh, I'll one... I'll ask the next question. So the next question is. Can you share an example of where cultural differences may be legally relevant in a case? And what kind of proof is the court looking for um, in order to take these cultural factors into consideration? And I believe Judge Roberts is gonna start us off. Yes, thank you. So I'm sure we all have our, all, our own list of these things. Um, but one of the things that I've encountered a lot and it actually comes up in a number of different ways, but particularly in settlement conferences. And as, as again, LA is an incredibly culturally rich and diverse place. And sometimes there will be a gift of a down payment uh, or even a gift of a house uh, as a wedding gift. And I'll be told, well, in, I, and I won't name a particular culture, but in this culture or that culture, uh, this parent has the obligation to give this kind of gift to the bride um, or this kind of gift to the couple. And very often that, that can be financially very significant. And I have the two parties and perhaps lawyers arguing about the way that a culture works, both of which uh, both of whom rather are members of that culture and I'm not. And so what we very much need in a trial setting or in any setting, including a settlement where those kinds of issues matter is it's worth having an expert. And it doesn't have to be some fancy credentialed expert. It can be a, a religious or cultural leader from the community. It can be anyone uh, that the court can perceive as a reliable messenger a reliable educator, if you will, on those cultural issues. And I've had that happen many times where, uh, again, two people of the same culture are arguing about what their cultural norms are and expecting me to make a determination of what that cultural norm is based on, to be blunt about it, those two family law litigants squabbling. And that doesn't really help me. So. Um, that's an area where, again, an invitation that if you have that kind of issue where uh, cultural differences are relevant, think about how you're going to bring that before the court. The other thing that is kind of related in my mind, at least to this topic, and an area where there have been some awkward moments where I wish counsel had done a better job of educating um, their clients beforehand I have had litigants from certain communities say to me, oh, we have our own courts. You don't really get to decide this case. And so I start off the hearing explaining to the person that, that I have jurisdiction under California law, that if they choose to have their dispute mediated by whomever and they're both willing to do that, that's up to them. But as long as I have jurisdiction, I have an obligation to exercise it. And when that's come up, and it's come up more than once, I'm always very surprised um, that the lawyers have not uh, kind of like touched on that issue beforehand. Um, I'm, perhaps they want me to do the heavy lifting on that, and that's why it hasn't come up beforehand. But it does make for a, a start of a hearing that is not beneficial in terms of everybody feeling like they're, they're being heard and they're being respected. And that can feel to the, the individual involved like uh, his or her cultural norm is not being respected. Um, so those are a, a couple of issues um, that come up for me. Um, oh, another one that just had this again, and then I'll let someone else talk about that, just had this come up. Um, in some cultures, 
Uh, it is normal for a happy married couple to have separate bedrooms. Um, and so that's a, it's a very, it's that, if that's relevant to your case for purposes of date of separation, it's worth getting that before the court. Now I've heard that enough times in certain cultural contexts that it, it's something that we, that we kind of are aware of. But if, if you're anticipating that the judge or the commissioner or the finder of fact may not understand that it's worth thinking about how to how to bring evidence expert evidence expert testimony or otherwise before the court in a way that 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 works so i've talked long enough about that anyone else on that issue gary are we on four i'm sorry yes oh i'm I wanted to share an example, um, which is uh, corporal punishment. Uh, many cultures around the world and even communities here in the United States believe corporal punishment is not child abuse. Um, it's actually in the Bible, right? He who spares the rod hates his, his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Um, and under California law, even criminal law, uh, penal code section 273, uh, physical punishment is not per se illegal. So it's difficult when one parent says the other is physically abusing the minor child, and then the other says, I'm disciplining the child, and that's how I was raised and how we do it in our culture. Um, and I generally believe that the person accused of child abuse uh, should be permitted to put on, you know, what's commonly known as the cultural defense, uh, because I think it goes to intent. Uh, but the fact that's going to determine whether that defense is uh, successful is going to be, you know, the frequency of the physical punishment, the severity, um, the facts leading up to the use of the punishment. Um, is the intent to discipline or to hurt. Um, and then I, I, when I was thinking about that, I thought about uh, two funny stories from my own upbringing. Um, my sisters told me when we were still in Burma, you know, they would be studying and then sometimes they fall asleep and then my uncles will throw a shoe <laughs> towards their direction just to wake them up. Um, and then uh, I thought about an incident uh, once we immigrated where I, I was smart mouthing my dad um, who, who never actually really used uh, corporal punishment. He, he liked to threaten it more than actually, he never really used it. Um, but I, would, I, I uh, responded that I was gonna call the police on him. And he said, sure, there's the phone. Go ahead, please call the police. Um, and that ended, ended the um, conversation real fast. <laughs> Thank you for that. Anyone else on, on four? All right, uh, let's go on to five. Have you observed areas of the litigation process that create challenges for certain groups of litigants? language just listening now i'm done uh things of that nature of what solutions can you offer as bench officers what roles can what role can the attorneys play uh commissioner cohen i was going to take this one first if i wanted to remind everyone that if um, your clients or you're aware that the parties have language needs including ASL, to please request online in advance of the hearing. Um, Spanish is usually readily available, but we have every single language that you can imagine available to us, but some of them do need advance notice. So please ask for that. And the services are always free. Similarly, um, but yet on a different issue, I wanted to talk for a moment about the ADA offerings here at the court. There is a specific web page on LA Superior Court's website that says ADA information. Um, 
council and our parties can always email our ADA coordinator with questions. I do see a fair number of the MC410 disability accommodation requests by litigants in my department. The process is very clear and spelled out in the rules of court 1.100. We're lucky to have um, to our assistance um, a coordinator, George Ellis. He's usually the one that I communicate with regarding what's permitted and what's available. Everything is confidential, but so long as we know in advance, I can put in IT requests. The ranges that I've had of requests in advance are, um, and it's been for council as well, um, scheduling matters in the afternoon, giving them priority, permission to use a laptop to take notes, um, I can order a cart or a captioner to help the party communicate. We can order document magnifiers. Uh, we can connect a laptop to a screen with a Word document so people who may not have um, use of their vocal cords can speak. In my department, we have a lot of people who have difficulty hearing, especially since we handle elder abuse cases. I have a ready-made device available without much request, so they don't always have to ask that in advance. Um, I had a litigant once who could not speak or read, so we had both an ASL and a CDI or a deaf interpreter um, available to us. Oftentimes I get service animal requests for emotional support requests or support persons. Uh, those are not always in advance, but I, I have said yes to every, every dog in my courtroom. I'd like to bring my own as well as a support animal, but I've yet to ask that of my uh, PJ. Um, but dogs are allowed or animals are allowed at the, um, judicial officer's discretion. Apparently we can require medical information. I've yet to require that, I'll tell you. Um, the animal though can be removed if they are disruptive, out of the handler's control, or apparently are not housebroken. But I have not had any problem thus far, and we've had many dogs in our department. Um, even without an advance request, I do pay very close attention to the needs of the litigants in my department. Um, at one time, many of you know, mosque, we have challenges with our elevators and our escalators. I think right now they're all working, but there have been many times when they are not working. And I had somebody who um, was not able to get to my floor. So we moved downstairs to a floor that had access. And one time we had somebody in my department and then the elevators and escalators broke. And we actually had to call 911 and the fire department had to carefully carry somebody uh, safely downstairs. There are some things that are not available, just so you know. Um, we, we do have designated accessible parking, but we can't just provide special parking for anybody as far as I'm understanding. There are some costs that are not reimbursable, but they may file a separate fee waiver. Um, and I think that was really just what I wanted to remind everyone that the process is pretty clear. Advance notice is always appreciated, but we are here to serve everybody in all of our departments. And that was one of the things I just wanted to talk about here today. Thank you. Uh, those are great examples. Other examples of areas of the litigation process that create challenges for certain groups or certain kinds of people? Well, I think, I think um, the intersection between remote technology and you know, persons who need interpreters can be challenging. Uh, if there's a a litigant on LA Court Connect who only has a cell phone and the interpreter will typically call that number, then the litigant can't hear the court. Uh, the court only gets the interpretation from the interpreter. Sometimes there's an attorney on a separate line. So I think it could be very disorienting for that litigant to participate in that manner. I'm not sure as far as court resources, how that could be you know, improved. I think if that situation arises and it certainly may arise, maybe especially in a domestic violence case uh, that the attorney could help maybe prepare the litigant for what may happen in terms of interpretation. So they don't think they've been cut off for the meeting or not understanding what is happening as far as you know, the availability of interpreter services uh, and being able to meaningfully participate, you know, in the, in the hearing. So I think part of what we're supposed to do today too, is to try to come up with solutions. So, um, I wanted to ask like, what did you try to do in that? And then I did also want to respond before you do that, if you don't mind, um, there was an anonymous attendee that said that support persons are not, should not require an MC 410. And that's accurate. I'm not saying that they are. I was just trying to mention 
the range of um, uh, things that appear in my courtroom. So, and I do offer a lot of those things even without an MC410 in advance. So thank you, you're clear the answer on that, that support persons are always welcome at all times in my department, even without requests. And knowing that request is not needed. But on the issue of LA Court Connect, I don't know if you wanted to answer maybe how did you handle that situation? And do you have suggestions on um, what else we can do? I mean, I oftentimes will do um, different types of interpretation. It does take often a lot longer, but I might not do simultaneous, I'll do consecutive. And um, that does definitely take a lot longer, but I don't always have the interpreter call the litigant that way. So that might be yes. one option. So I think, yes, consecutive um, could be an option. And I guess it depends on how many interpreters are available and which parties, you know, how many parties may need uh, the services on that day. All right. Um, anyone else have anything on that issue? I would like to add that I think um, over the years of my career, one of the greatest innovations that I've seen um, uh, that's really taken off and always needs more funding is the self-help center. The ability to have a place where you can send people who are in a system that is intimidating and foreign to them um, uh, is, uh, uh, is just amazing and it's transitional in many, in many ways. So uh, I, I, I think we need more of it. The Shriver Project is a good example of uh, um, uh, a, a means of accomplishing that goal. Um, it just, uh, it's, it's very expensive, um, but it's necessary and we need to make sure that it is continuously and increasingly funded. Amen to that. Yes, I agree. And they, they're amazing. I mean, I refer, you know, every case at the end of every hearing. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I refer you to the self-help center. If you have questions about enforcing your restraining order, renewing your restraining order, et cetera. So um, anybody who works with the self-help, all those who are here with our deadly settlement officers, everybody who volunteers for the court, and those that we uh, send cases down to, we thank you very, very much. The last thing that I would like to say on five, and this is something that comes up a lot, um, a, a lot of people for cultural language, a whole host of reasons, are very hesitant to speak in court. One of the things I think we all learned as judicial officers is to recognize the need to draw people, self-represented people out um, and let them know things that I learned as a kid that my, what I have to say matters. Let them know that draw it out, be sensitive to the fact that they may, where they come from, it may not be safe to speak to a person in a black robe. It may not be safe to be in a courtroom or for whatever reasons they may not feel safe and to really bend over backwards. Um, and then the, the, the piece of that that's for attorneys. Um, I, and again, I'm sure I'm not talking to anyone present here, but some attorneys when they're representing someone against someone who is self-represented uh, can get engage in behavior that's very close to bullying or, or over the line in terms of bullying of that litigant and trying to take advantage of that, of that cultural disadvantage. And um, I don't know any judicial officer that sees that in a favorable way. So um, that is something that I think we all have to really work on in terms of really making sure that every person, regardless of their background, regardless of whether they're represented, is given an opportunity to tell their story uh, in court in a way that, that, that they feel heard. Um, so I think we, we have one last catch-all question, but I know we're, we're running out of time here. Let me ask for guidance in terms of whether there are any questions that you want us to address or shall we wrap up or what, what should we do now? I mean, maybe if anyone has any last things that they want to say, and maybe you can just in, incorporate the last question, which was if you had any other examples, but um, I would just really want to join along with uh, Judge Roberts just saying that our role is to allow everyone to be heard, no matter who you are and where you where you come from and what kinds of backgrounds, whether you're represented or not. I do believe that all of my colleagues do try to do that on a regular basis. 
It is helpful that we have trainings and conversations such as this, um, both for all of you to help all of us constantly learn, because I learn every single day. And I um, thank all of you to allowing me to have this opportunity here today. So. Yes, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's been a real pleasure. And thank you to all the panelists. And again, thank you for the, for the morning. I, I, it's always wonderful to, to be educated on such important issues and to hear of other experiences and perspectives. So I really appreciate the work that's being done here today. I am also seeing an anonymous uh, question that says, have we, been, have we informed litigants of the availability of different translated court forms? There are many other languages that the courts are available. Uh, available to the court. And um, I, I do believe I try to do that in my department. I definitely also refer, as I said, people to the Self-Help Center. I assume my colleagues have done that as well. But just so you all know, there are many translated court forms available. And to all of the um, attorneys, I, if you're in my department, please know that I always refer you to the Judicial Council website. So you're using the most current court forms, especially in the restraining order world. They are updated on a regular basis. And so whether you're using them in any other language or uh, in English, know that current court forms are always greatly appreciated and used. But thank you for that thoughtful question. Anyone else have anything else to say in closing? I'd like to thank the panel um, for sharing your time, your wisdom, your knowledge with us today. And I expect that all the other participants here will walk away with the same feeling I have, which is that we're very fortunate to have the judicial panel we have here in family law in Los Angeles County. Thank you all. And uh, I don't know if uh, I can see my uh, view on the screen. I don't know if it is. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Helen? Yeah. You're definitely there, boss. Okay. I uh, talking about assumptions. This program started about 12 years ago. Based on this assumption, honestly, very truly, that judicial officers don't know much about culture. The judicial officers in family law, they are, you know, not part of us. They are above the, you know, uh, middle class. They are highly educated, graduate of uh, Ivy League co university colleges selected by for a political reason. And uh, when we were talking with Gitu and Linda and Alan and Diane, that one of our hope was that some of judicial officers would join us so we can talk to them about culture. Ten years later, I am hoping that some of our attorneys to join us in order to hear from culture from judges. The role is changing. From being, hoping that you come to us and you learn from us, now we have to come to you and learn from you. And don't make this assumption. Don't make this assumption that because her name is Honorable Cohen, she has certain attributes that if her name, his name is Bloom, is different. Don't make this assumption that because her name is Kim or name is Yang. Therefore, I, I am humbled. Truly, I'm humbled. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, if I may make one more com one comment in, in conjunction with issues that were raised by judicial officer, this is my suggestion. At one time, before the uh, clients, they take they walk into the courtroom, uh, come outside and look from the view of from the gallery how they see you and how they see the, your court stuff. Uh, one of the reasons that we started about 15 years ago, this idea, because in one week I was in Ventura County, in Orange County, and in San Bernardino. I'm not going to say which county, but in one county, 
the uh, behind the head behind the bailiff was a cabinet, and on the cabinet was the south uh, southern state flag. And uh, one county on the bench next to the bench officer was a the statue of Mary and a rosary. And uh, on one county, there was a big sign, don't drink, don't uh, bring anything or just shorts. But Bailiff was having a big cup of uh, no, uh, iced tea. It was summer and he was drinking. These are some of the areas that may make people feel more comfortable in your courtrooms as to the environment of the courtroom or may they make him dis un uncomfortable. But we are all learned from you. Thank you very much. I asked uh, Carmen if he can, she can post the picture. Of if we can do it before we leave, that will be great. Otherwise, uh, I know that Bill has some comments to make. Gitu has some comments to make. Please, whoever wants to go first. What picture would you like me to put up, Abbas? I just, I don't know. I sent you a picture. See if you can post it sometime. In, uh, from, this is a picture in 2018. I want you to look at it. I haven't received that email. I'll check it out. Then I will send it. Okay, Gitu, you go ahead. I will send that email to you. Bill, do you want to go first? I'll wait for you. Um, no, I actually just wanted to reiterate what many of us are saying. We're fortunate to be in a county where we have uh, judicial officers who are culturally aware and sensitive and thoughtful and have a collaborative community among themselves to learn from each other. Um, so we are really fortunate. I know that we all have a lot to learn and there's an endless amount of subjects that we could bring up over the next few years. Um, but I think that every um, time that we get together and we have these um, presentations, uh, we come away understanding that individually we're doing a lot to work towards a culturally more aware, sensitive, um, you know, justice system and so forth. But we also remain aware that systematically and systemically, there are a lot of things that we could still be working towards. So um, thank you for your help with that and for your presence in, in these kinds of forums so that we continue to grow. Thank you again. Bill? Yeah, for, for my part, I would start by uh, noting the, the importance of technology and how far it's come uh, these days, because uh, I don't know how many of you know, but Ms. Stein is three hours earlier than everyone on the panel, and I am three hours later than everyone on the panel. So we've got a six-hour spread. The other way around, Bill. Is it? <laughs> I'm ahead of you. Yeah, okay. The other way around. Yeah, I knew it. I knew we had you here for some reason. Uh, but uh, there was something that I wanted to mention to um, our judges, uh, and that would not be Judge Roberts and, and Commissioner Cohen, who have been around for weeks, uh, but for the new ones. Uh, one of the things that, that we have learned is that all of our judges that come to family law as their first assignment, most of them do not know a lot about family law, but they all know a lot about civil litigation and evidence, which is a saving grace. So there was uh, a judge by the name of Norman Epstein, uh, and most of my work focuses in the arena of minors council, uh, we, we were talking about a different seminar and Judge Epstein told me one day, he said, well, I don't know anything about family law. I'm brand new to it. Six months later, we had another discussion and he said, you know what I've learned about family law? 
is that one day on the bench is actually five days on the bench. And, and I wanted to impart that message to Judge Rojas and to Judge Yang and to Judge Kim and to Judge Bloom uh, and to Judge Weinberger, because in the family law arena, that I think is a very accurate statement. Uh, the further to Judge Yang's point about multi-generational housing, uh, frequently we will see attorneys who believe that, and, and I'll limit this to the minors counsel role, when they come to court and they say, well, dad should not have custody because there are five children and there's only one bedroom in the house. Uh, but I think that goes directly to the point that Judge Ann was making. Uh, it's a multi-generational cultural issue for a lot of families. And so we can't lose track of how important the cultural competence is when it, when it crosses all of the ethnic lines, all of the cultural lines and what have you. Um, and finally, uh, my message to the judges, uh, be careful when you get the attorney that says, uh, I'd like to say one more thing. And then the judge says, briefly, I don't know one time where I've ever seen anything brief whenever that word is stated. So uh, having said all of that, uh, as usual, this is a wonderfully enriching experience. Uh, getting to know all of you, getting to present with you. And hopefully we will see you for the next five or 10 years uh, if you learn to love family law as much as most of us do. Thank you for your participation. Thank and you. Thanks. Thank you. And a huge thank you to Abbas and to all of the coordinators. We want to give you a big round of applause for inviting thank us. And, 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 and the picture that you saw and Carmen, you put it back again. That was a picture of lunch with your judicial officer in 2018. And we're looking forward to having lunch uh, in person. Yeah, it was, for, yes, you know, with it, that, that picture shows 14 judicial officers sitting side by side, including, I see Judge, Judge Cohen, I see her, I see uh, Judge Bird, which uh, retired, Judge uh, Silverman. Anyway, I just thought that this will hopefully going to be a picture that we're going to have next year all together and uh, after lunch. And on that note, uh, if there is any other comments or from judicial officers, from attendees, uh, otherwise, thank you very much. We, thanks, thank to our, uh, really our friends in LACBO. Uh, Carmen been sitting behind this video since seven o'clock this morning, and she worked until eight o'clock last night to put this program together. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, all the people in CLE in, in LACPA. And on that note, thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Gitu. And see you all later. Thank you, Ellen. And uh, until next year, thank you very much. Thank you all again. Please take care. Enjoy your weekend, everyone. Are we waiting for Carmen? Yes, we're going to have uh, another four or five minutes of our video, but uh, so are we staying on for a picture? Is that what you yeah. want us to do? Yes. Oh, okay. Take down the JPEG. Yes. We're going to take the picture. Let's just take a picture of the group I have been taking. Take, take down the picture that's on the screen. No, first, sir, yeah. Yes. And Steve, if you are there, turn your videos on so we can see everybody. Thank you very much. Get the picture. Linda, did you take one? We have that. All right, we're good now. All right. All Great right. Senior. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Have a great afternoon. Did a great show. Thank you. Thanks.